call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, August 23rd, 2021, and the time is 7 p.m. We are present this evening in our school board meeting room located at Northfield Public Schools District offices. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Uh, Dr. Hillman, there were a few items in the table file. Yes, we had some appointments this evening, some increase, decrease, change in assignment, uh, some leaves of absence, and retirements, resignations, or reti or some resignations, excuse me. That's what we have in the table file this evening. Okay, if there's no objections, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Mm -hmm. Moved by Amy. Is there a second? Second by no. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we now have an opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for residents, business and property owners, parents, students, and employees of the Northfield School District to address the board. We ask that you adhere to the guidelines set in place by district policy 206 regarding public comment. This is a listening opportunity for the board and not a time to debate an issue. You are prohibited from making comments about specific students, staff, or administrators. The board respects and values input from the public but when it relates to a specific student, staff, or administer, administrator, such input must be heard by the appropriate personnel, such as the building principal or superintendent, and not during an open meeting of the school board. We require that you limit your remarks to three minutes. You are not allowed to yield your time to another person and is expected that members of the public will address their remarks with civility and respect. You will uh, come to the podium to address the board after being recognized by the board chair. Identify yourself and the group if you represent one and please state your reason for addressing the board. I will now call on those who have signed up to speak up, uh, to, speak up to the podium in the order in which they arrived. Amy Gorwitz, Vice Chair, will be monitoring the speaker's time. She will signal each speaker with the time they have remaining at one minute, 30 second, and 10 second intervals. We now have 30 minutes uh, for public comments, so we will work through as many people as we can. Okay, so we will begin. Our first um, person for public comment is Dr. Felicity Enders. Welcome, Dr. Enders. Thank you so much. My name is Felicity Enders. I'm a professor of biostatistics at a large academic medical center, but I'm here as a concerned parent. Um, and I have two children in the Northfield school system and we have a packed house tonight. And I think that's because there's so much going on in the world and many of us don't know what to do. That's partly because the Delta variant is different. A lot of what we learned over the past year and a half really needs to be thrown away. And that's scary. When we think about COVID and the Delta variant, we often focus on our individual risk, our risk of being hospitalized or dying, or getting long COVID. But for you as a school board, we need you to focus on the population risk for the whole set of people to whom you're responsible for the school system. And that population risk is different because the number of people infected impacts how many total people are we have two major tools to fight COVID. One is obviously the vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine was just approved for everyone age 16 and over. That's wonderful news. I hope that you'll begin thinking about whether or not you'll require that, just like we do for other immunizations. But the vaccine is not gonna be enough. The vaccines were developed to reduce the risk of bad outcomes. They don't really do much to reduce the risk of transmission. They do some, but nowhere near enough in the face of Delta. The second major tool is masking. Really wanna thank you for requiring masking in our schools. My son is nine, he can't be vaccinated yet, and I'm terrified. But I need to send him to school. He needs to be in person. It's really time. I have some concerns about specific risks. At lunch, there's an expectation that kids will be unmasked. You gotta unmask these. But doing that indoors is going to be a big problem. That's a potential transmission event. I strongly suggest that people have lunch outside if they so choose, at least for the fall. 
not going to work in January, but it can work right now. Second thing is I saw something about reducing social distancing and contact tracing. We need to keep those tools in place. Delta really requires us to use every tool that we have in our arsenal. We're all here because we want what's best for Northfield. And I urge you to work together to use your power for good and do what's best for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Enders. Next, um, we will hear from Jane Runsheimer. Welcome, Jane. Hello, I'm Dr. Jane Ronsheimer. I'm one of the family doctors here in Northfield. And um, I'm here on behalf of my colleagues at the Alina Medical Clinic and also at the Northfield Hospital. Um, basically just in support of the district's school mask requirement to start the school year, especially given the current surge of the Delta variant of the COVID-19 infection. Thank you for having the courage to support this decision. We know that masking works to pre prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to prevent death. Hundreds of studies and real life experience have shown this to be true. The most recent study just published on July 29th, 2021 by our own University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic has solidified the importance of wearing masks. The study took mannequins that mirrored human beings and placed them both with masks, the inhaling and exhaling mannequins and found that if both were wearing masks, droplet transmission was reduced by 99.5% regardless of the type of mask worn or the distance between the mannequins. Strong new evidence from our best medical research institutions. Simply put, masks are very effective at preventing respiratory droplet transmission and the spread of COVID-19 disease. As of August 12, 2021, 378 children have died of COVID-19 infection in the United States. That's compared to 90 to 100 children that die of influenza during a flu season. 378 children, we do not want this to happen in Northfield. <clears throat> I have had patients in our community die of the COVID-19 infection, not children so far. I really want to keep it that way. Masks absolutely cause no harm and will allow our children to stay alive and stay in school. And with everyone wearing masks, those who are in contact with a fellow student infected with COVID-19 will no longer need to be quarantined for 10 days at home. Students can remain in school, which is very important. It's much better for mental health, which is something I saw really stressed last year in a lot of kids that were home. And it's so much better for the learning of all of our students. We can also prevent the spread of COVID-19 infection to our vulnerable teachers, students, and other staff. These are also my patients, people with diabetes, people with cancer, people who are immunosuppressed. And those vaccines aren't quite as effective for those people and we're trying to protect them as well. Masking is unselfish and it saves lives. It is the right thing to do to care for each other. It will allow us to stay healthy and stay in school. Thank you for making the right decision for our community. Thank you, Dr. Runsheimer. We will now hear from Ben Flannery. Welcome, Ben. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Ben Flannery. I'm a pediatrician uh, and the uh, medical director uh, for primary care at Northfield Hospitals and Clinics. I'm here today, one, to thank the school board uh, for making the right decision uh, to still require masking as we did last year for, for students and staff this year due to the continued threat of COVID-19. They followed the science and the recommendations from the Minnesota Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I could riddle everyone with data and science and facts um, of all the specifics about masks and vaccinations and COVID, but I'm a pediatrician. So data to me gets overwhelming. I'm a doctor of children, so I need to make it simple. Um, and so simply put, the science says COVID is bad, okay? As pediatricians, as doctors, we've played down how bad it is for kids because it wasn't as bad for kids as it is for the elderly. We have the elderly vaccinated now and they are safer. Kids are still at risk um, of COVID-19. The science also says masks are safe. They're safe. We wear them all the time it's at, at my work. I will probably wear a mask at my job for the rest of my life and they are safe. Um, masks prevent COVID. Uh, we've proven that in studies. Masks also prevent RSV and strep. 
and influenza. Uh, vaccines are safe. Vaccines prevent COVID. These are all very simple things that we've proven with science. It's just, those are the facts. We cannot forget that one of the largest populations of unvaccinated individuals is children. Um, this year compared to last year is no different for children. It may even be worse because Delta spreads quicker than the regular COVID. But no kids under the age of 11 are vaccinated. So everybody that's feeling that we're in a better place than we were last year, for kids, we're no different. So why would we change masking last year, but not this year for kids? So I really appreciate that the school board took this decision and thank you. Thank you, Ben. Our next speaker is Lindsay Brisky. Welcome, Lindsay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today um, on behalf of myself and the 520 like-minded individuals who have signed the petition to remove the mask mandate for Northfield schools. I would like to open with a quote from Nelson Mandela. Um, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than in the way in which it treats its children. Think for a moment how you would respond to a parent who forces their child to wear a football helmet outside every day for fear of falling debris from the sky. I stand to argue that most adults would recognize that this behavior is irrational, abusive, and fairly absurd. You see, this adult is forcing this child to participate in a ridiculous charade in order to satisfy his own hypochondria. Recognize children are almost as likely to die from COVID-19 as they are to be hit from falling debris from the sky. It has become abundantly clear that we have lost the ability to maintain a proper perspective in regards to masking our students. As of August 18th, 2021, the CDC reports that 73 million children have tested positive for COVID-19. Of those, 368 have died. While any life loss is a tragedy, zero disease is an unrealistic and unachievable standard to meet. When the pandemic began, the lack of knowledge justified fear, but that excuse since has vanished. The virus is less dangerous to children than the seasonal flu. To add some perspective, a child dies from pneumonia every 39 seconds, according to UNICEF data. Despite the surmounting evidence that masking provides little to no protection, the school is still committed to making students as miserable as possible. Let's set the record straight. The science behind K through 12 mask mandates is at best conflicted. The harm to children's physical and emotional health is real. Do you, the school board, understand what damage you are doing to our kids? teaching them that the air they breathe is toxic, that everyone around them is sick, depriving them of the ability to see faces, filling their lungs with bacterial particle filled recycled CO2. Young children will fail to develop linguistic skills. Students and teachers are much more likely to misinterpret each other. Children with hearing impairments will be severely disadvantaged at the lack of ability to lip read. Our children rely on facial cues to grow and develop. How are children supposed to develop social skills when they do not have the privilege to see their classmates' faces? Are you willing to stand liable to the damage you are creating? The mental, physical, and spiritual well-being of our students will forever be hindered by these decisions. As Oscar Wilde said, children begin by loving their parents. As they grow older, they judge them. Sometimes they forgive them. This generation of children will have much to forgive of us. Let it be known, as long as our children's smiling, beautiful faces are covered, the pressure will stay on this school board. Thank you for your careful considerations today. Thank you, Lindsay. Our next speaker is Jessica Librock. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, I'm Jessica Liebrach and I am the parent of a second grader, um, about to be second grader at Sibley. Um, forgive me, I'm emotional because this is an emotional subject for many of us. Um, this has been on my mind constantly since the school board made this decision. Um, and I have my second grader in mind when I'm reading this. Um, we moved down to Northfield schools two years ago from the Lakeville Farmington area because of your excellent school district. We want to be a part of this district. Um, I won't remind you of the facts of COVID. Lindsay did a great job of, of saying that. Um, but from where we, I stand and many other parents, this is a vast overreach of the school board's authority to be putting this mask mandate in place for our children. Um, and unfortunately, since COVID began, we have seen that there have been twice as many deaths from pneumonia 
with children, and this is with masking and with social dis distancing in place. Um, I'm not alone in this perspective. Lindsay has mentioned the 500 plus parents and concerned citizens who stand behind me as I'm speaking. I'm not here to argue whether masks work or vaccines work or turn this into any sort of political issue. We are a group of parents that believe it is our job to make health decisions for our children and based, based on all aspects of their physical, emotional, and mental health. Weighing all of these risks, it is not the job of the school district. And based on the decisions of the surrounding school districts, many agree that it should be the choice of the parent. You have implemented this decision without parental input. And let me respectfully remind you that each of you as school board members have taken an oath to represent all of the parents of the school district. You knew that this decision would be polarizing as the message that we've received is that if we don't agree, then we are free to find an alternate option. Respectfully, I'd ask that you ensure that your direction represents the majority of parents before you make this type of statement. We are the taxpayers and this is our school district. You have the opportunity to make a different decision here, but if you will not, then the least that you can do is provide greater transparency to the specific criteria that you will use to determine when this mandate can be lifted. We deserve to know the exact trans transmission rates and vaccination rates that you are after. Will the mandate be removed in total or will families who choose not to vaccinate their children be subject to mask requirements indefinitely? Providing clear answers to these questions is critical as we evaluate the best course of action for our children. But please do not dismiss the real hardships that parents will face when considering moving districts and the many families who for a variety of reasons can't entertain other options and will be forced to comply with a mandate that they do not believe is in the best interest of their child. We will not stop asking you to remove this mandate, but in the meantime, providing us clear cut criteria to allow us to understand when this will be listed is the appropriate next step. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jessica. Next to speak is Kyle Hoffert. Welcome, Kyle. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Kyle Hoffert. I'm a, a family physician in Northfield, and I also have four children in the Northfield School District. So I'm here both as a physician and, and as a parent. First off, I want to thank you for making the difficult decision last time about mandating masks in schools. Uh, we know that uh, as a medical community that the Delta variant, again, has made things much more challenging for care for uh, patients and for our entire community. I think that uh, you may know that the school mask mandates are actually pretty popular nationally. A recent Axios poll from about a week ago uh, showed that 69% of people surveyed did support a uh, mask mandate at schools at the current time. I think everybody in the room can agree on a couple of things. We all want uh, we all want our kids to be in schools. We know that in-person education is superior to online education for most students. Most of us who dealt with our students either being quarantined last year or being at home for uh, during, in, during uh, um, at-home learning, uh, they didn't do as well as they did when they were in school. So we all want kids to be in school as much as possible. The mask mandate that was passed does keep to a minimum the number of kids who are required to quarantine. And I think that is a good thing. Uh, that both, help, both helps child education and parent employment as it makes it much more challenging for parents when kids are home from school. I think everybody in this room wants to protect children. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, we know as a medical community that the Delta variant has set us back in our fight against COVID, but we still know what we're dealing with and we have tools to fight it. Those tools are mainly threefold, vaccination, masks, and distancing. And it's only through a layered approach that this is most effective. Can't take out one of those and still have an effective fight. So we know that the Delta variant is more contagious and makes kids sicker more rapidly. Uh, we know that data recently released from Canada showed that uh, children infected with the Delta variant are almost three times higher, uh, have a three times higher likelihood of being hospitalized. Nobody wants their kid to be hospitalized. We know that the death rate is not high with children, but for most of us, we would say one death is too many. That's preventable. We all. I want to summarize to say we all want COVID to be over. None of us enjoy wearing masks. We all want to try to do what we can to end the COVID pandemic. And the way that we do that is by working together. None of us are working on a different side when it comes to COVID. COVID doesn't care who we are. It doesn't care about our beliefs. 
it's going to affect us all. So I hope that we can all work together. And I appreciate all the work that you've done for our children. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hoffert. Uh, next, uh, we welcome Kevin Christofferson. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kevin Christofferson, and I am an employee at Northfield Hospital and Clinics. I'm the lead uh, data analyst there. I've been doing healthcare data analytics for over 25 years, seven years for this community, uh, 10 years for the 1.2 million members at Health Partners, three years at the Level One Trauma Center in Minneapolis, HCMC before that, and then six years at the Minnesota Center for Healthcare Ethics. But I also, with that background, I'm not here um, to spew data points out to you. Um, I would uh, strongly encourage you though, when you are listening to data to really unfold what is being said. Um, perhaps incidence rates of infant or childhood uh, adolescent deaths are low, um, but that fails to consider the transmission that those infected, unvaccinated potentially um, children, especially those that are under 12, um, the risk that they carry to the vulnerable population. Uh, and I am in that population as well with four autoimmune disorders. So I'm grateful, even though my kids struggled, struggled mightily with social uh, interactions, lack of social interactions, online learning. Uh, I have four children, well, three children in the Northfield School District. One just finished her um, entire schooling years here and was taken to college on Sunday. Um, but the fact that you have um, put their health um, and the community's health, not just the kids, but their parents, their grandparents, um, as your priority um, needs to be recognized and applauded. And I'm very grateful for you for doing that. Um, I do not represent my employers past or present. Uh, I'm just a parent, one who was aware of the petition along with many others who decided not to sign it. So I would also um, point out that 500 people, it's, um, it's a small voice considering uh, what this community is. Um, and the fact that you are willing to uh, listen to those who will unselfishly put their kids into less than optimum situations um, because they're not selfish enough to say my right should supersede all. I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. We will hear next from Dr. Sarah Mertz. Welcome, Sarah. Dr. Hillman and members of the board, thank you for having me. My name is Sarah Mertz. I'm a scientist and parent. I wanna thank you for the hard work you've invested in assessing the data to come to the conclusion to require universal masking for people age two and older in our schools. As you know, the mission of the Northfield Public Schools is to deliver educational excellence that empowers all learners to engage our dynamic world. I'd like to highlight several aspects of the strategic plan and the handbook. Um, first, in uh, one point of the strategic plan, has to do with climate. And it says, we will create and strengthen an environment that fosters mutual respect, responsibility, and rigor, and ensures the right to physical, emotional, and intellectual safety for every person. I'd also like to point out that the dress code in the district's handbook states that students can choose to wear or not whatever they like, as long as their choices do not pose a threat to the health and safety of their students. So I do think it is within your mandate to ask us to mask our children. And I really appreciate you doing that. The data is clear. A primary route of COVID-19 transmission is via respiratory droplets. And it's known to be transmiss transmissible from pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic people, as well as symptomatic people. 
The preponderance of evidence shows that mask wearing reduces transmissibility per contact by reducing transmission of infected respiratory particles in both laboratory and clinical contexts. MIT has created an indoor safety guideline tool that you can find by searching MIT COVID tool. And uh, they, that tool illustrates very clearly the importance of masking. The tool shows that if an individual infected with the Delta variant, so the tool can actually look at different variants, enters a 25 person classroom, COVID transmission will be low if all individuals are masked and speaking for eight hours. In contrast, if individuals are not masked, COVID transmission in that same classroom is high after 19 minutes. Data also shows that student learning suffers when in-person learning is not possible. So the best way to keep students in class is to mask, which will reduce COVID transmission. So I thank you for your decision. Thank you, Dr. Meritz. Our next speaker is Travis Smith. Smitha? I'm sorry if I did not. Travis is your first name? Okay, thank you. Welcome, Travis. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Travis Smith. I, uh, I'm going to speak from the heart, and most of you are not going to like what I have to say. Um, I have three students in Northfield schools. And for the school board to say what my child can and cannot do within reason reflects back on me and think and says that the school board doesn't think that I'm a fit parent. Last I checked, not one of you provide for my child. Not one of you. We pay your salary. You are an elected official. You need to listen to what these parents say. And you guys do not realize the mental problems that are caused by wearing masks. My children come home crying because they're sick of them, because they got in trouble. How many of you sweat abnormally? That makes the mask wet. Have you heard of waterboarding? Try breathing through a wet mask all day. After recess, after gym. To me, you're causing way more harm than good. My, myself and my family have had COVID. We got it by wearing masks. We were all wearing masks when we were in the room with the affected individual. Yeah, right now my mask is down because I'm talking, but this is how I was wearing my mask when I got infected with COVID. It affected me severely. It took two weeks to recover. And I'm still here saying, repeal the mask mandate. What makes you think that you are more educated or more superior than other school districts around us that are leaving it up to the parents. Last I checked, Northfield was the only one in the Rice County area that is mandating it. Fairboat's an option. I'd love you to prove me wrong. Also, when George Floyd passed away, the school district said that it was in the students freedom of speech that they could organize a walkout and leave school during the beginning of this pandemic. What's to stop the kids from creating their own about not wearing masks and walking out? Last I checked, or last I saw, the school board said it'd be, they'd be an insubordination if they didn't wear a mask. I don't think one person got in trouble for walking out. I'm sorry, what Travis, your time is up. Thank you for your comments, Travis. I'm sorry, that is out of order. You are not to, uh, no, I'm sorry. You need to sit down. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you, Travis. Um, our last um, person to speak is Michelle Martin. Welcome, Michelle. Yeah. 
Yes, they, they posted it on our so if they look on the website, they'll see that there was an error with the Zoom code. So it should be posted on the same page that they can find the um, link to Zoom. And we apologize for that. Now, thank you for asking for that clarification. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, my name is Michelle Martin. I am a parent here in Northfield, and I'm also a teacher in the area. Um, I've been a teacher for over 20 years and taught all through last year, um, the ups and the downs. And I am here to um, talk a little bit about the impact of masks on student learning. And I have to tell you, um, kids don't learn when they're worried. We know that. Kids don't learn when they're scared. And what the masks do in our classrooms is they enable kids to relax, to know that they're safe. <laughs> I listen carefully, please. And I have a lot of experience with kids and I know them well, and I know that parents know their kids well too, but I'm asking everybody to trust that teachers know how to create a safe environment for their kids and that they will know how to keep the kids safe and feeling um, secure. We always have extra masks for kids in case they need a new one. We also know that when they are at ease, they're able to learn, and we know how important that is gonna be this year. We know how important it is for them to know that they're safe and in a protected environment where they don't have to worry about getting sick or making their grandparents sick or making a friend sick. Thank you for supporting the mask mandate. Thank you for giving our kids a safe place to learn until they can get vaccinated. Thank you for making a hard decision and a right decision. We really appreciate it, those of us who are in the classroom every day. And we really, really are looking forward to teaching these kids again in person. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That concludes um, the portion of our uh, meeting tonight on public comment. We thank those who spoke to the board this evening. The board appreciates the time you took to share your perspective. If you were not able to speak tonight, you are able to email the board at board at northfieldschools.org. This address is also posted on the district's website under the community um, slash school board tab. So with that, we'll move on to our next portion of the agenda which we will uh, discussion and reports. Tonight, we welcome elementary school principals, Nancy Antoine, Scott Sanis, and Sam Richardson. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right, announcements. Yeah, no, we have no announcements and recognitions this evening. I'm sorry, I meant to say that. Okay, we'll move on to now for items for discussion and report. We have the elementary schools improvement plan. And as I mentioned, we welcome elementary principals, Nancy Antoine, Scott Sanis, and Sam Richardson. Welcome. Our, uh, presentation. Okay. All right, well, good evening and thank you for allowing Sam, Nancy and myself to be here tonight to present the second annual elementary school improvement plan. Uh, prior to last year, each elementary school had their own school improvement plan and presented it individually to the school board. Over the course of the last couple of years, our district has made monumental moves to streamline our curriculum and instructional practices. So students at Bridgewater Elementary, Greenville Park Elementary and Spring Creek Elementary have similar experiences and opportunities at all three schools. Our teaching staff and support staff are all receiving the same professional development and our building goals kept getting more and more similar. So it only made sense we make this joint effort and have the same school improvement goals for all three schools. You can go to slide two. The purpose of the school improvement planning process is to establish a clear set of shared goals aligned with the district's strategic plan that inspire action and align efforts for students' growth and development. In a few minutes, you're gonna hear about this year's literacy, math, and SEL goals. For the first time, these goals are coming from the district-wide teacher teams who spent a lot of time this summer working together on goal setting, curriculum alignment, pacing, et cetera. They worked hard and made a lot of progress. During workshop week next week, those team members will share their work with each elementary staff. 
to kick off the year. Slide three, please. The established goals in the areas of literacy, math, and social emotional learning for 2021 or for 2020 2021 school year. A new goal measuring parent satisfaction was created. Due to COVID-19, several factors affected the evaluation of progress towards school goals. Slide four, please. Our key reflections. Students did demonstrate learning growth during the school year that involved in-person learning, uh, distance learning, and Portage online instruction. Once the MCA results are released, they will be shared with the board, staff, families, and community. Family conferences, Zoom conferences, and two postcards sent to every student helped engage families during a unique learning year. Family conferences went so well last year, we've carved out time in this year's calendar to allow them to happen again this year. Families will have the option to either meet with their child's teacher in person or via Zoom Tuesday, September 7th or Wednesday, September 8th to kick off our school year with school starting on Thursday, September 9th. We are really proud of the fact each student received at least two positive contacts and the fact that they received uh, two positive contacts from each, from each staff member. Um, what we did is we printed out uh, postcards and then the classroom teacher was responsible for uh, one of the postcards and then other staff members in the building were responsible for the other postcard for each student. So over the course of time, each child did receive two of those. Let's see, Elementary staff demonstrated strong use of online tools like Zoom, Seesaw, Schoology, IXL, Dreambox, Reading Plus, and Lexia during the year. During the spring of 2020, we quickly pivoted from an in-person learning to distance learning. And while it went okay, we realized we, we realized we learned a lot in the process about technology, scheduling, and teaching. Last summer and over the course of the first quarter of the school year, teachers became better prepared to teach in a distance learning setting. So when the pivot to distance learning happened around Thanksgiving time, it was, it was smoother and more seamless than the first one. The day was structured better than previous spring because of the feedback we received from families and staff, and it went as well as we could have imagined. With the COVID situation last year, we saw individual classrooms needing to quarantine. So in a number of classrooms, when they pivoted to distance learning, um, we had to adjust. Students had to adjust, teachers had to adjust. In one case at Spring Creek last year, a teacher who had quarantined her students uh, a teacher was quarantined, but her students were all in school. With the help of an OWL camera, the teacher taught from home while her students who were in the classroom supervised by an educational assistant and then teachers who were on their prep time, and it actually worked out okay. All our staff, including teachers, EAs, front office staff, custodians, and other support staff continued to impress on the journey that was a 2021 school year. Nancy Antoine will continue to share the key reflections from 2020-21. Thank you, Scott. Um, slide five, please. Okay, so some of the things that, that I really wanted to point out is the the work of our staff. Um, I would I would be the I'd be the first one here to say that our staff worked an incredible amount of hours. They put in so much time making sure that they cared about each individual child. Um, I had so many conversations about what can I do to reach this child. What what suggestions would you have for reaching this specific child? How do I reach this family? We, went, we did the door-to-door -door, um, activities that, that mean things to families. We did the things that meant a lot for children. Again, reaching out, trying to figure out how to make it work for each individual child. Due to uh, COVID procedures and distance learning, staff connection changed. Staff wellness efforts and rounding practices were important for supporting our staff. And that's one of the things that we're gonna focus on as we start back this fall, is focusing on our staff, making sure that, that we are reaching out to them making sure that they are taking care of themselves, but also making sure that we take care of them. And uh, we, we all know that if we, could, if, we do a, if we do a good job of taking care of our staff, our staff will take care of, of the children, and that's who's most important here. The rollout to distance learning was more positive this year for staff and families because of that family conference. We spent that family conference time trying to find out, how do I reach you? What's the best way to reach you? What's the best way to, for us to communicate? So therefore, we knew what piece worked the best. And I think that's why distance learning worked well this last year. It worked much better than the year before because we had a little more prep time for that. The year before, we didn't have any prep time at all. We, we went right into it, and that's no fault of anyone. But at the same time, 
this past year, we had that they we had that time to plan with the, with the students, so they knew how to use Zoom. We also explained to the parents how to use Zoom. We have a supportive community here in Northfield, and we've had we've had lots of volunteers. We have been so blessed to have all those volunteers, but at the same time, last year we weren't allowed to have them, and they were very, very missed by our teachers and our students and all of the staff at all the schools. Slide six, please. So if I, we look forward to the, our school improvement plan goals for this coming year. Again, our, our teams met this summer and they were the ones that, that um, devised our goals for, for all three elementary schools together. So for reading, we're looking at 80% of our students meeting our district standards. And you can see the different areas for the different grade levels. For ki kindergarten, they're working on phonemic awareness and letter sounds. Grade one, working on decoding those CVC words, those the consonant vowel consonant words, and then again the CVCC words for the second semester. Second grade is working on decoding the CVCE words. The first for the first semester and the vowel teams for the second semester. And grades three through five will work on grade level reading fluency, which again is going to be measured by our STAR assessment as opposed to our MAP assessment this year. Next slide, please. For our math goal, we're looking at 80% of our students um, attaining 90% accuracy on the district developed quarterly common assessments for the um, timed math back fluency. We have learned, and this isn't this isn't like, like rocket science, but we learned if our if our students know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide whole numbers, they are much more prepared for adds, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing fractions, decimals, any other things, but they have that, that firm foundation for moving forward in math. And so that's what we're focusing on this for this year. Slide eight, please. Social emotional learning, of course we, and this is something we're always gonna focus on. We're always gonna wanna make sure that, that our students have good social emotional learning skills. And, and we're, um, the piece here is also looking at what's not being said with kids. And so our teachers have a tool called the Sabers, and they're, we're looking at reducing the percentage of students to, to be determined at risk from this fall to the spring of 2022 20, by 2%. That means that 90% of our students will not be at risk. So that's the last year was 88%. We're looking at 90%, hoping we could ever get close to that 100% mark. So that's our goal with social emotional learning. And I will let Sam Richardson, bring us home. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we can go to the next slide for slide nine. Um, several of the things that we learned last year will be uh, repeated with improvements and extensions of the work that we did. The family engagement goal was a positive one for us. The origination of the goal was based on uh, parent feedback that we received on how um, they would like to be more um, engaged and receive more positive feedback. and so. Um, the positive feedback to students uh, through the postcards, also um, the 90% goal for our family conferences, which will be the first um, two days prior to the start of the school year. And, uh, so we'll be looking at different ways we can connect with families. Zoom has become part of our world and a great way to connect with uh, busy families or families who can't come in person. The employee engagement goal, um, Rounding conversations were something that we instituted in the past two years and have been a great way for staff um, to not only give um, feedback about what's working, but also feedback about um, ways that we could improve and um, also give shout outs to colleagues, to staff, um, identify different things that are going very well. We also know from our staff that uh, regular feedback helps them do a better job, know what they're supposed to do, know what um, ways they can improve uh, how they serve uh, students and our schools and our district. And so working on uh, methods for um, quarterly feedback will be part of our goal there. Um, last year was the first year of our anti-racism goal. Um, we worked very hard to um, identify culturally appropriate resources, uh, books and materials that we can have in our media centers and in our classrooms. Um, help make sure that all of our children see themselves represented in the learning materials in our school. And we also continue to work um, as a staff with our PLC times to learn how we can better help students be uh, respectful and kind um, to all students uh, to stand up when others are not being kind or respectful to others. 
Next slide, please. Um, Scott and Nancy both mentioned our partnerships. Um, it really stood out to us um, how well the, the community in Northfield, the parents, um, our colleges and um, other organizations, Healthy Community Initiative, Northfield Promise, um, help um, in our schools with students. And um, that's in a number of different ways. It helps with enrichment groups for students. It helps with students who need additional support before and after school. And we missed that this year um, when we had to do things differently. And so we will continue to partner with those groups, not only to make sure that we have support for our students in person, but make sure that all of our students have what they need to learn in whatever model they might be participating in. Um, stewardship, um, as you heard Scott in the lead uh, to this report, we have worked really hard to connect all three schools. And that also um, includes our work with our resources, our budgets, and how we um, handle our uh, finances and resources within the school. So um, things that we can do when working with Hope Langston, um, teaching and learning department and Val Murdestorf um, to be more efficient and more effective uh, with our funds that we have um, is an important ongoing goal. Uh, next slide, please. And I have broken the podium. <laughs> that was not in the script. <laughs> We're gonna play on. Okay, uh, so we will be replacing the podium as part of our stewardship <laughs> for the district. Uh, literacy, um, our strategies and assessments um, for the, the literacy area um, cannot uh, say enough about the teacher teams and the work that they did um, this summer. And so we will be um, having a number of um, different strategies used to not only um, identify those skills that need to be taught, but to provide those interventions that students need. That includes K2 Hegarty, which is a very specialized way to teach foundational skills. Um, also the press interventions, which, uh, which has been provided for staff to use. And then that new STAR assessment, as well as um, common assessments that uh, staff have um, developed will be used uh, to continue to measure continuous progress for our students. Um, the math fluency that uh, Nancy mentioned will be a key one and uh, will be re measured regularly. And then um, on the behavior side, as we look at um, students coming back to school, a huge focus will be um, connecting all the key people from uh, parents to teachers to supporting staff um, and figuring out where are students at when they come in. Those family conferences will help with that. And then how can we work together to get them what they need each student has had a unique experience in the last 18 months and uh, we wanna support them. Um, and then our MTSS is um, our multi-tiered multi uh, systems of support. And that's looking at uh, the whole child. Uh, that includes attendance, that includes looking at uh, health and wellness, that looks at their academic performance and we try and um, figure out ways that we can support those students wherever they are at. We mentioned those parent satisfaction goals strategies there as well. That is our report. Um, thank you uh, for allowing us to present. And Scott and Nancy and I um, appreciate the opportunity to work together uh, for all of our Northfield schools. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. I really do like this format when um, the elementary schools um, present together. So thank you. For, for the excellent report. Uh, board members, questions and comments? Amy. Well, thank you all principals um, for telling us about your plans for the future. And it's very exciting to see what you have coming forward. And I know you've sort of generally answered the question that I'm about to ask, but I'm wondering if you could give me more specific ideas of sort of lessons that we learned from the last year or expectations that you have that you'll, you good or bad, things we learned from COVID that we're gonna be taking forward as far, I mean, are we gonna need extra review time at the beginning of the year? Or are we gonna, just let me know what you're thinking of how COVID will affect next year, either good or bad. Well, I'll jump in. I think it's kind of hard to say, you know, we. I think I'm correct, Dr. Hillman. Our K-2 students were in school, what was it, 81% of the school year last year? You know, so there, that, that, was, that was fantastic. I think our three, four, five students were in school for high, 70, high 70s. And uh, 
you know, it, it felt like a, it felt like a pretty normal year from that perspective. I will say that, you know, we, we made it up to Thanksgiving, which was fantastic. And then we went to distance learning. And then when we started up again on the 19th of January, we started it, it felt like we started a new school year. You know, we approached it from that perspective that, that, you know, we need to, we need to start like we do work one, week one of, uh, of the school year. So, um, outside of that, I think it was, I think it was, um, a pretty good year. And, uh, what we learned is that, or what we know is that a lot of our folks, students, staff, parents, um, are more tech savvy now. And I think the programs that we've used, um, Schoology for one, you know, our fourth and fifth grade teachers, it was only some of them were using Schoology and now all of them are using Schoology and that will get those um, fourth and fifth graders um, rising off to the middle school in a couple of years, uh, more prepared for middle school. So there are a lot of good things that have happened. I think one organizational aspect um, that, that, you know, we learned from last year is that Prior to last year, all of our students would congregate or the majority would congregate on the playground before the school year start or before the school day started. And last year, grade levels were assigned to doors and because we were, we were isolating. And that strategy worked so well that I don't know that we will go back to congregating on the playground before school, even when you know, we're past this pandemic. I think another good thing is um, how we release students. When the bell rang, we, we released students and everybody would travel through the hallways and now they go out there assigned grade levels assigned exit door and it's a much much smoother transition for everybody going to um, their pickup location walking home or getting on the bus so a number of of organizational things were were learned through this process and we're going to keep those as we move forward i'll step back and see if sam and nancy have anything to add um one of the interesting things that we noticed um, was how much more effective we were when we had um, those family conferences and ongoing communication with families. Um, parents know their children very well, and so they were able to identify uh, with teachers sometimes things that weren't clear to students or uh, ways that um, their students um, maybe could progress more um, with a different technique. And I think the teacher-parent relationship uh, was very strong. And it's one of the reasons I'm excited for the family conferences, continued use of programs like Seesaw uh, for those regular communications. I think sometimes uh, waiting until November to have that first touch point about academic progress, something that we don't need to wait that long. And uh, we introduced a new uh, program right at the end of um, the school year called talking points that allowed more frequent communication through text to families. And that was another way that we were able to um, more quickly communicate with busy families and um, make sure that we uh, could stay in close communication. Only thing else I would add is that, um, that it's not that we learned it, but it really validated our knowledge that those family partnerships between the parent and the teacher are so important, so very important. And, and it's just that, that one thing, if we can all work together for the students, we have a winning combination. And our parents have been, our parents have been very supportive and have been absolutely wonderful partners. So we really appreciate that. And like I said, um, it, we're gonna really take that effort to this fall again, to make sure that we're um, solidifying that with our family conferences. And I think that's gonna, that's gonna going to help our students long, long term. Well, again, thank you. And thank you for the answers. And I look forward to hearing you next summer where you can tell us that you easily met all your goals. Great question. Thank you, Amy. Questions, other questions or comments? Claudia. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for your presentation. I um, really appreciate all the care that you take for our, our teachers, our staff, our children. I hear great reviews from all of my friends and colleagues who have kids at the elementary. So thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with Sabres. Could you talk quickly about it just so that I have a better idea of how um, you're gonna use Sabres to uh, make that reduction at, in the at-risk group? So uh, Sabres was identified as a, a research-based tool that would allow um, teachers uh, to give feedback about how students are doing uh, in a number of different ways, um, social, emotional, um, in terms of academics and learning and behavioral. 
And um, as they would do these rating scales in the fall, it would help us identify um, students that um, perhaps needed more support in one of those areas. It would help us identify students who maybe seemed like they were having um, a good start to the year, but if one of those areas um, maybe was rated uh, higher by a teacher, it might help us uh, uncover some things that, you know, perhaps um, anxiety in a student um, who is demonstrating some, some anxious habits in the classroom, but overall was doing well academically, and, and we, could, we could figure out ways to support them in the school. By doing this uh, in the fall and in the winter and in the spring, we can see changes over time, we can see growth. This year was a more difficult um, because um, some of the students were not with us during the fall, and uh, when they returned in the mid-year, um, we just started a relationship with them in person at that time. So it was a very different um, experience for our staff to do that. Um, but our behavior coaches um, often will uh, work with individuals and small groups based on those results. Um, our special education uh, teams uh, will make decisions for IEP programming based on, on those results. So it's a valuable tool. Um, a work group that I know was um, in progress this summer was looking at ways to involve students in that process as well. Um, help, um, at um, giving their own feedback too on, on how they're doing. So yeah, this time has taught us a lot about um, staff and student uh, health and wellness and how we can support. So it'd mean like connecting them to some resources and maybe connecting them and checking in with them more often? Right, yep. Okay. And uh, teachers know their students very well and um, can create community and can support students when at times they need more help than they can give when they have um, 18 to 28 students in front of them. And so uh, that's why we have um, behavior coaches and school mm -hmm. psychologists and social workers. Um, Turnbrook Mental Health is another. Excellent, thank you. And we also love to find out who has that best connection with that, with that student as well, because that can be that person that, that can help out. It could be a different person for any number of children, because you've got certain, certain students that will connect well with, like say the, the school nurse, or with the behavior coach, or even, God forbid, with us. <laughs> but some that some that does happen, so we're able to go down and, and have that little conversation with the with the student, and hopefully hopefully make the whole situation better. But it's again, it comes down to looking at the needs of every every child. Great, thanks, Claudia. Other questions, comments? No. You have demonstrated. Thank you for your report, by the way. Was you have demonstrated again your leadership that never missed the opportunity to grow from a crisis. You've done it well. Thank you. Pass on the crisis. Please. <laughs> I said we'd like to pass on the crisis for next year, please. Yes. Well, it's not our doing. <laughs> well said, Noel. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Just, of course, echo what, what Noel said. Thank you for your leadership and, and for the work. It, as I said, it's just, it's so great to see the, the buildings come together and be so collaborative in your efforts and, and the academic goals. Um, will the PLCs then um, focus on the academic goals or are there any nuances within buildings that um, you would um, have maybe potentially different strategies or... Um, different needs. So our PLCs will focus on our academic goals as well, but also in addition to that, our, our PLCs will focus on our equity goals, so which, are, which are part of our, our building goals. So we'll have one of the, one of the four weeks will be um, just dedicated to um, our, equity, our equity goals so that the, our PLCs will look different during that time. And we're working to assign, assign all the staff to a, a, an additional PLC just for their their equity um, PLC work, so hopefully we can we can address those goals as well during that time. Okay, excellent, thank you. And then another question I had: you um, have indicated surveying parents, which is great. Um, do you have timing of that? Um, will they be more pulse surveys, or um, have you a different strategy that maybe you had had in the past for for getting parent feedback, which we all know is important. Yeah, so last year, we, as you know, for several years, we'd been using an annual parent uh, satisfaction survey, usually in, I would say, that November, December timeframe. 
last year we went to the pulse survey uh, strategy where we could do a shorter and quicker um, feedback from parents so we could use that during the year in flight. This year we plan to return to our annual parent satisfaction survey. And remember the key thing about the parent satisfaction survey, it's not just the survey. So there's pieces where we ask the questions uh, of families, they give a rating scale on, uh, I think it's 18 or 19 different questions. Uh, then we also ask for free form comments so that can inform uh, the uh, ratings that are provided. And then I think the most important thing that you know maybe doesn't everybody doesn't get to see is the rollout of the data. So the rollout is really important because our building principals take the data, they take a look at the ratings of all of the questions, they take the two top questions, and they take the two lowest rated questions. They start with their staff and they will also use it with their PTO as a parent representative group. And they will ask them, okay, here are the top two questions that uh, we were most highly rated on. And we ask, why do we think that is, right? What are the strategies that we're using to be able to get really good ratings on that so that we can try to replicate that in other ways? So we try to look at, okay, wh what are we doing that people seem to be satisfied with? We can't just look at the things that we're happy about. So we look at the two lowest rated questions. And we say to ourselves, we say to the people who are helping us review the survey data, if you were to give this question a five, what would it look like? What would we be doing? What are the kinds of things that would need, need to be in place for you to give it the highest score on the survey? And from that, the building principles developed some goal. One of them you heard tonight. One of the areas that we had as a lowest rated question was around that I, I received positive notes, uh, phone calls and emails from the school staff about my child. And every child in our system has so many wonderful things about them. And we wanna make sure that we are proactive in sharing with parents what are the things that we see that their child is doing really well? We know that that kind of positive reinforcement really can be a very positive spark. And that led to one of the goals that you heard about tonight. So the postcard strategy came from one of the lowest rated questions on our parent survey two years ago. And so that's an example of how we're taking the parent data and activating it to make sure that we're utilizing it. So we will, we will probably run that. I think we have it scheduled for November and it might be after the first of the year. I don't have the schedule with me right now, but we will go back to that once a year parent satisfaction window. And then we will do the rollout process and then principals give their staff and their families updates uh, regularly about what they're doing to act on that data. Okay, excellent. Thank you again for, for your outstanding work. We are so grateful for all you do and for just waking up thinking about how you can do better for kids and going to sleep thinking that same thought. So thank you for all your work. We really appreciate it. Okay, we will move on to our next um, presentation. We welcome Daryl Keller, director of the ALC and Portage for his site improvement plan for both the ALC and our Portage online learning program. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Try and make room with this podium here. You didn't hear me. Sam, that's coming out of your budget. Make it work. Actually, I think it's under warranty, so you're okay. <laughs> All right, I am Daryl Keller, uh, director of the ALC and also the Portage program. So you're lucky enough to have a repeat of me tonight. I'll have two different school improvement plans. So we'll start with the ALC. We can go to the next slide here. So the purpose, the, the ALC, the main goal, if you will, is to provide a safe, respectful, welcoming learning environment for all students and anyone that steps through the doors of our building. We can go to the next one. So the 2021 review, um, we had a couple goals that we looked at. The first one there is 75% of the students entering the ALC from the high school will be at or above the credit threshold. And basically, if you remember what that was from a year ago, uh, what we looked at is if students are on track to graduate on time, that means they're on track with the threshold. If they're behind that, if they're behind that too much where we can't get them done in four years. That's what these statistics represent. And so if you notice, the very top box there in the middle uh, has NFLD, that's the high school. We were at 57% of the students were um, at that threshold. So we had the majority of the students that were coming, we, we were gonna be able to get them done in four years, but we still had uh, you know, quite a bit, a little over 40% there that we weren't on track to graduate in four years. 
then the 2021 school year, we got that shrunk or we raised it up, however you wanna look at that, to the high school students being at about 63%. So we were having much more, um, many more students were coming at a, in a better spot, if you will, where they were able to get done in four years uh, as a result of some of the things that we were doing. So some of the things that we were doing, just to refresh your memory as we did, independent study, uh, credit recovery, quite a bit of that. And so trying to get those students caught up before they even made the move to the ALC. And so that was one of those influencing factors that got us to that uh, increase. The second goal down at the bottom there is overall attendance rate for the ALC. Uh, we'll reach an overall consistent attendance of 90% for the, for the year by grading period. And just a, remember, a reminder that we do have eight grading periods in a year. So we have a lot of short grading periods. Uh, if you notice, it's a pretty tiny little graph there. I don't have a laser pointer to point at it, but the first uh, three, there's a red bar um, that kind of goes across. There's a horizontal red, and then there's the vertical reds. The vertical reds are for the last school year. If you notice, we were, we were doing really well with the start of the year. We had 92%, 91%, 95%. Uh, then we took a little bit of a um, hiatus there because for grading periods, four, five, and six, we were on distance learning. I didn't feel as though putting that data where we used a different measurement tool to assign the attendance was necessarily comparing apples to apples. So I didn't include those. They were, they were in the mid to high 90s because if you remember the attendance marker for that is if they were connecting with an adult or logging into the computer that counted as attendance, whereas these are actually being in the building. And so I took those out just because it skewed the data. Um, and then when we returned back to grading period seven and eight, you can notice we were at 80 and 81%. So we took a little bit of a step backwards there in the springtime as far as our attendance rates go. And so that is, as you'll see in our next upcoming one, returning back to that goal to try and get that back up. Uh, next slide, please. So key reflections, data, and, and student stories. So from the last year, this next bar graph that is also very busy. So I apologize for the people that uh, aren't big fans of a whole lot of lines. Uh, but as you'll notice, the red lines again are the 2021 school year. If you can decipher them through all the bars, what you'll notice is it goes, it's lower than traditionally average of our previous credits earned. And it goes pretty low there at the middle of the year, lowest it's ever been. And we rebounded a bit towards the end of the year, which was fantastic to see, but it was generally lower um, than, than we have had. And that credit completion, the little reflection on the right-hand side there is, I did a little data analysis. I do enjoy my data. I've come to appreciate that and come to own it. <laughs> I used to never say, oh, no, data, that's not my thing. But I do enjoy data. So I deciphered a little bit. And when we were in person, our average is about 67 to 70% of credit completion, which is a pretty respectable average. Um, the hybrid, when we were doing you know, some in-person, some distance, it was 61%. So it did go down, but not a whole lot. The distance learning really hurt our students. That was 33%. And so that's, if you remember in the springtime, we had that, um, there was a caveat for at-risk learners that they could come in for certain. And we took advantage of that and had different strategies to try and get them in. Uh, our students really uh, need that in-person relationship building aspect. Uh, and so even though um, it was needed, you know, the distance learning was definitely needed in the, in the pandemic, it did provide some fantastic data to just reaffirm what we always thought or we always believed, but we didn't have the data to back it. And so that was uh, interesting to pull that data together. On the very bottom, the very... Uh, Super proud about this uh, results. We have what's called the SEI, Student Engagement Instrument. And it's used by Promise Fellows. The AmeriCorps uh, organization uses this. And so it's 36 questions that students just go through and, and, and reflect on their experience. I just put two of them up there that um, I think are fantastic. One of our goals is, again, to provide that safe, welcoming, respectful environment. And the two that I included here, um, my teachers are there for me when I need them. 100% of our students either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. 
and 100% of our students agreed or strongly agreed with, at my school, teachers care about students. So that is fantastic. There was more, but I didn't have enough room on this busy slide already. Um, just super proud of the results that we, as a staff, have come together to make that environment or climate very positive um, for all the students. Uh, next slide. So the 21-22 school year um, school improvement plan goals, we broke them down into those pillars, if you will. So the first pillar is the people, and there's a three different subcategories in that one. The family engagement goal for this year, uh, we do have the, as we just, was a perfect segue for me, the parent survey. Um, we do normally have about 10% of parents complete that survey. So the first goal is to bump that up. We want to get to at least 20% of parents complete that. So just so we have more of an accurate picture of that baseline of where parents are at. Um, it's valuable, whoever fills it out. So I appreciate anyone that has done it in the past. And thank you very much. But we wanna try and bump that up to try and get a little bit better picture. The employee goal, the next one there, uh, increase the perception of staff, that staff meetings make efficient use of time. So that was my lowest, one of my lowest in my uh, own um, employee engagement scores. So it was a 3.71. So what I'd like to do is bump that up to at least a score of four. And so I've been working with the staff, trying to um, collaborate with them of how can we make that feel efficient, good use of time. And so that's a, a goal, employee engagement. For anti-racism, we have um, talked quite a bit about it last year as a staff through PLCs and other uh, trainings that we've had. And so we decided to take a, a fairly large step in um, what we're trying to do or what we're planning on doing is uh, actually developing a class. So we have that class developed. And so we're gonna include that into um, our regular rotation of classes that we offer. And so students can sign up for that. Talking through anti-racism philosophy, discussions, reflection, um, as well as cultural diversity, uh, competency, those kinds of topics. So pretty excited to have that as one of our classes, the actual class that we'll have in school. Uh, the learner outcomes, this is where that previous where I alluded to the attendance. So the overall attendance rate for ALC students will reach that consistent attendance of 90%, trying to get back to that. We were there for the beginning of last year and then uh, you know, you've all been there. So um, trying to get back to that 90% attendance, which is a very lofty goal, but we were there, you know, for years before that, we were right on the cusp. Last year, we were there for the first three game periods. So I think we can do it, which is just a fantastic goal. Uh, the second one there, overall credit completion rate, we want to get to that 70% again. Same thing, we were making progress from those previous very busy bar graphs that you saw. We were making progress towards that, but we weren't quite there at the 70%. Um, so we want to get to that point. For stewardship, this one is dedicated to Val. ALC will maintain a positive budget budget by the end of the 21-22 school year. So hopefully we will have positive budget again. We're making strides with that, um, making sure we're financially responsible. And then partnerships, the ALC will enhance programming by adding the partnership with youth, youth force development of Rice County called Youth Build. And so what that program is, is uh, the Rochester ALC currently has that in place. And what it amounts to is um, providing an opportunity in the construction trades for our students to take a class and then partner up with a uh, construction instructor to not only build things that are needed for the community, but also learn while they're doing it. So for example, Rochester, they do everything from building sheds for um, local organizations that are in need of a shed to building ramps for ADA um, compliance and accessibility. Uh, and just kind of using all kinds of things, Habitat for Humanity, helping out with, with that program. And so we're trying to start that here in Northfield as well. Um, one of the things that's been talked about quite a bit is to help with um, remodeling, renovation of mobile homes in the area uh, so that they not only learn a valuable trade, but it's a much needed um, uh, thing in our community. So that would be fantastic to kind of be a win-win partnership. Uh, next slide. So some of the strategies, I've already mentioned some of these, but 
uh, the family engagement, we're gonna try and uh, connect with those families, connect with those parents even more so than we have in the past, just to try and encourage and assist filling out that survey, trying to get the, those results in. Uh, the director myself will collaborate with staff, trying to get those staff meetings as meaningful and efficient as possible. And then the anti-racism, we're gonna continue on our trek towards that classes um, actually on the schedule for the start of the fall here, the start of the school year. And so just continue to get that um, embedded in our, in our program. Uh, some of the learner outcomes strategies that we're going to be using for that goal. Uh, continue to use the Hanover research. So I've talked about that a couple years in a row. It's a fantastic article. So if you do like to read <laughs> educational articles, I'd point you in that direction. Um, but it's fantastic in how to work with uh, at-risk youth, but also just best practices for things like attendance, credit completion, those kinds of topics. And so we're going to use continue to use that to work with students to get those credits made up, that kind of thing. Um, and then the next one, the ALC staff will offer supports to struggling students. We do have a new counselor this year. So that's fantastic that we have uh, access to a counselor that's gonna help with scheduling and other things. The academic advocate will be um, part of the program as well, helping those struggling students that are uh, identified on our MTSS or SST student support team, those kinds of things, uh, Promise Fellows and Social Worker. Uh, stewardship, again, just we have been making, we've been trending in the right direction. So making sure that we continue to collaborate as a staff, to make sure we use, use our resources efficiently and effectively. And then the partnership, as I already mentioned, just continue to um, work towards that as we're looking more and more likely that that's gonna be a, a goal for fall trying to get a whole lot of done in here in the, in the summer months, but I think we're gonna have it ready for the fall. Next slide. There's the wonderful uh, end result. So we had, the, again, the largest graduating class that we've had, uh, 44 graduates, so it was fantastic. And you'll notice there's some pictures there. We actually got out for a canoe kayak adventure there in the springtime, so it was, uh, a good end of the year where we had some nice weather. We were able to get out and about. Any questions? Excellent report. Thank you, Daryl. Questions or comments? Claudia. Hey, thanks for a great report. Um, I was curious about the class that you mentioned, the anti-racism class. Is it um, a core class? Is it an elective? Uh, so it is taught by our English teacher. So uh, the activities that she's gonna be doing in there will count as uh, the English standards. And so there'll be some writing involved, um, some reflection journaling, that kind of thing. And so she's woven it into being able to count it for English credit, but it also be an elective credit too. Amy. Thank you, Daryl, for your report. I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked the other principles and that is what are what are things you learned during COVID that you're bringing forward to improve for this next year? Yeah, so uh, the big thing that we learned was that in-person relationship and so we're kind of doubling down on that again and so uh, really making sure that we um, form the relationships not only with the students that's incredibly important but we did start to um, have more traction with family um, outreach. And so trying to take advantage of that um, where we gained a little bit of momentum and run with that to try and connect with families too. And on a separate topic, how did you get so many people in the graduating class when you had such poor attendance there? How did that work out? Yep, so the attendance was always good. The credit completion was the big dip at the, uh, and that's, if you notice the one slide, it was a very pronounced um, mm -hmm. valley uh, because we took grading period four was very tough, but the second half of the year, they kind of took off and that the last seven to eight grading, grading period that we had, um, our attendance was not in the 90s, but the students, when they came, they came to work and they were just um, very gun ho We had a whole lot of students that were very motivated to be done and wanted to graduate. 
and so they were very productive. So it was exciting to see the the productivity level. They were they were super energized to get through it and get it done. And then my last question is kind of uh, foreshadowing what you're going to be talking about later. But wh what do you see to be the connection between ALC and Portage? Does Portage steal some of the students away, or is there a flow between the two? What do you see? Yep. So that's that's a wonderful question, which I don't know the complete answer yet because we haven't gone through the the, the new Portage, if you will. Uh, the last year's Portage was in response to the pandemic, and so there was a lot of families that were primarily health concerns were going to the Portage route. I see the the future kind of as what online has been around for many, many years already. And so it, it's gonna, in my opinion, start to go back to that where the, the, the students that want that is just as a choice, an educational choice, will start to navigate towards that, um, that avenue. And so that really won't take, um, you know, the ALC students, we have a variety of programs where we have the seat-based and we have the independent study where there's some flexibility I don't think it's so far. It hasn't taken a lot of ALC students away. Um, we've gained some out of district people that are, you know, in different aspects of where they're coming from, and I think it'll continue that down that path where it won't be a huge um, draw from from our ALC students. They'll probably stay kind of where they're at. But some of those students that are looking for a little bit of an educational choice or an educational change we'll start to take advantage of that um, down the road. Thank you again. Other questions, comments? Julie, if I can just follow up on something that Amy asked, yes, Daryl is modest. I think the key thing is we saw that dip, you know, in the middle of the year when our area learning center students went to distance learning. But I think the important thing is the area learning center as evidenced by those couple of questions about how students feel about their teachers, right? They have a hundred percent agreement that they feel connected to their teachers. And so even though during that very difficult time for a lot of our ALC students, our teachers never gave up, right? They continued to reach out, they continued to invite, they were creative in how they could keep helping those students stay engaged. And even though the credits weren't completed, one of the beauties of Daryl's approach of having the shorter uh, grading periods is that in a traditional school, if you had those kinds of issues, you would really be done for the semester. But that thought process behind the shorter grading periods and behind making sure that those are intentional connections with students, when things started to turn, you saw the response, right? You saw how quickly they rebounded. And I think that that goes to show even when the data is not in our favor or not good, the leveraging of those relationships that the Area Learning Center has worked years to develop and the reputation that it has and why so many people come from other schools for the Area Learning Center program is re was responsible for that rebound. And I think, you know, Daryl is very mild mannered and he doesn't, you know, he, he shares the good news, but we just really need to revel on that because that when, when that, that group of students really struggled, especially compared to the other students and everybody struggled, but this group of students really struggled. Daryl's leadership and his team who have been together for a long time were able to help make sure kids stayed engaged. And then when the time was right, they were able to rebound quickly. So I just, I think we really need to emphasize that even though that, that graph does not look great, you think about the human impact of what happened at the end. And I think that that's the important part of the story. Yes, thank you, Dr. Hillman, for those comments. Um, always a great report, Daryl. And it's just, you demonstrate, you know, you have a uniquely diverse group of students and you always demonstrate how keenly you understand what it takes for them to be successful. And the Youth Build program is just a wonderful example of that. Um, that is really exciting. Um, how will course credit work for that program? Uh, you mean as far as like what area yeah. it counts as? Yeah, are they able to get course credit? I'm assuming. Oh, so it will do? be elective okay. credit for sure. Um, trying to work through that. So it's in its infancy. So at some point, I'd love to try and figure out a way to get them content core area. But right now it's elective credit for sure. Um, so we just have to get down the road a little bit so we can start to get some of those standards woven into there. And I for sure will talk to Rochester ALC um, because they, they're already, you know, a couple steps or a couple years into it uh, to just see what they're, what they're doing and what their thoughts are. 
Uh, it's really exciting and we'll, we'll look forward to, to future reports on that. The other area that you have spoken in the past is this the growth of the English language learners at the ALC. Has that leveled off a bit um, or where, what are kind of uh, increase in numbers of students that you're seeing coming in as English language learners? Yep, so it has, um, I, I, I guess plateaued is a good word, but it's a little misleading word because uh, it's plateaued high. And so it's still up there in, in that high range where we've never you know, seen that, where we're in the you know, 30, uh, 30 students or so that are EL learners. So it's a really high percentage of our population. Um, and so it's plateaued high, um, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's been great because it's exposed not only the, the staff, but the stu other students to all kinds of different cultures, all kinds of different um, things that you know, were not necessarily intended, but um, it, one, of our, one of our pride and joys, which hopefully we can come back this year is our cultural meals where we have once a month where we have a cultural meal celebrating a different culture. Um, and the students make that, and then the school kind of shuts down for an afternoon, takes part in that culture for that brief amount of time with, through food, um, and we bring in artifacts. We talk about you know different uh, celebrations or traditions that the cultures have, um, and so it's just been fantastic. And that's kind of the seed that started the the anti-racism class, um, and so it's been fantastic to to have students come in. Excellent, thank you. And of course, we just we know you will will present about Portage, but we do need to acknowledge the hard work that all those students did to get to that stage um, in June. And you know, we we got to see the you know we knew there was a lot of work behind that, but boy, it was just an amazing energy and excitement. And it's just always such an amazing event to be at. And it's it's also. Um, you know, interesting when the students said they were the first in their family to graduate from high school and how proud that student was of, of that achievement. So, so thank you for everything you do to get them to that stage on June, June 3rd, it was, um, I believe this year. So, so again, you're just um, really understand what it takes for these students to be successful and you are relentless in continuing to find ways to ensure that happens. So thank you for that. Okay. So we can segue into, oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Thank you for oh, no, no, lagging okay. me down. <laughs> um, given your student makeup, uh, did they have issues with um, internet access or technology use or a place to go to be online and causing that dip? Nope. Um, so we did have, uh, we had fantastic thanks to HCI and a lot of community partners that came together for hotspots and all kinds of things. So we offered the hotspots. We did have quite a few students that had um, internet access already. The ones that didn't, we had the hotspots worked really well. It was just a um, you know really good process of getting them signed up, getting in the hotspot, getting them connected pretty quickly. Um, and so that was fantastic to see. So we didn't see that is the dip. Um, we saw the, you know, the, just the, they weren't coming to us every day in person, kind of seeing, looking us in the eye, if you will. And then it's easier to pick up more shifts working and that kind of thing. And so, um, so it was, it was good to, to have them come back in, in different aspects. Great questions, board members. Um, if there are no other questions regarding the ALC, we'll move on to the Portage Online Learning Program. All right, round two, here we go. All right, I am Daryl Keller. I'm the Portage <laughs> Online <laughs> Director. Welcome. All right, so next slide. Uh, purpose, the, the Portage Online Program will prepare every student for lifelong success through customized access to an education designed to meet their unique interests and abilities of every enrolled student resulting in measurable student engagement and academic growth. Next slide. So um, this is kind of the reality of the situation. So I apologize for people that are like, what, what the heck, what's going on? Um, so the 2021 school year, uh, we did not have SIP goals, so there was not a SIP plan in place. And so I don't have um, goals to review because it, it wasn't in existence at, at that time. 
uh, the 2122 school year will serve as a baseline for this program because we are now an official approved online provider. And so the plan is to have this in place for years to come. And so this will serve as that baseline year. Next slide. So these are the reflections that I got from the staff that were part of the Portage program last year. I uh, had just limited access to the Portage program last year. So I um, gained some insights from those that were much more involved. So on the left-hand side, you'll see 13% of sessions consisted of students logging in and completing no work. And so what that, what that would show is that the engagement level for those 13% of sessions was minimal. However, on the right-hand side attendance, this is kind of goes back to what I was saying that counts, they logged in so that counts as attendance, but it doesn't count as engagement. So that's misleading to use that attendance only and just say, oh, they were showing up so it was engaging. Um, and so that is just a, something to make note of. 54 students returned to buildings second semester. Um, and so basically there was a lot of movement in and out of the programming. So to go from the buildings into Portage is pretty um, fluid. Like we, that's the online world is flexible and we can accommodate that pretty easily. However, going back is tougher um, for a lot of you know logistical reasons, of course. And so to go from the online back into the building was tough. However, there was a lot of movement both at elementary and secondary of students going in and out. And so that makes it challenging for that. Can, um, continuity that uh, students need for that progression of a lot of subjects. Uh, next slide. So I again, broke it down into those pillars uh, for our school improvement plan goals for the Portage program. So the first one, 100% of Portage students and families will participate in at least one Portage informational conference meeting during the 21-22 school year. So we did just before this, I had the elementary and secondary open houses. So if there's anyone in the audience that was there, hey, thanks, thanks for coming. So that was good to see families. We went through handbooks, we went through registration of classes for the, the secondary students, um, went through general questions, things like that. So that was great just to start get that information out there. Um, we will also do the family conferences that are coming up and we'll also have more informational conference type meetings for for families. So trying to get all those um, students and families involved participating is our goal for the family engagement. For the employee engagement, rounding conversations will be conducted. So this is my first year in the Portage program uh, full time, if you will. And so I want to make sure talking with staff, getting to know, you know, what's going well, what could be improved upon, those kinds of things is very important, um, kind of coming in cold, if you will to try and get that insight. So that's the goal for the employee engagement is to try and get 100% of staff uh, rounded with. For the learner outcomes, 80% of this is, again, this you know, um, shout out to Hope. So thanks Hope for helping. Um, because we have no baseline, because we have no historical data to go from, this is an educated guess at what we think is a reasonable um, marker, if you will, or bar to get to. So 80% of secondary Portage students will maintain their pacing to stay on track with credit completion. And so what that basically means for, for online programs, I've been in ALCs for many years. And so one of the things that I've noticed being a credit recovery program is students come to us from online programs drastically behind in credit. So they were in the online, it just didn't go well, they got behind in credits, then they come to the ALC to try and make up those credits. It's all about pacing. And so we're from day one here, stressing that pacing to make sure you stay on track um, for that graduation, because it is easy when, when it's kind of turns to you as all self-motivated to keep yourself on pace, to wake up, take out that laptop at home when you're comfortable on the couch and you know kind of work away at some stuff. And so 80% um, of students to maintain that pace so that they can stay on track to graduate on time is our, is our goal. 60% uh, of Portage students will meet or exceed their star expect expected growth. And so that will be uh, the star test that they alluded to with, with uh, the earlier presentation, trying to make sure that we have that meet or exceed that uh, star growth for the uh, Portage students. 
and then the steward stewardship program will at least break even for the 21-22 school year. So trying to make it a fiscally responsible program. It is in the first year, so that's often hard to do with that first year program, but that's um, what I'd love to try and achieve that goal is to at least break even for the program. Next slide. So some of those strategies, uh, the Portage staff from last year, the feedback that I got um, from what I'm learning is that the families, the family connection to school was the strongest it's ever been. Uh, you're, you're in their living room and they're in your living room as a teacher. And so the, the connection were, were really strong. And so trying to build on that as far as our communication, as far as our outreach, all those things. And so continue to work on that or uh, um, encourage that. Employee engagement goal, I'll work with the staff to make sure the rounding conversations are in place, effective, continuous. And then for the learner outcome, the learning coach. So um, are you all familiar with the structure of the Portage program or do you want me to kind of dovetail slightly and talk about that? Why don't you share that a little bit, Darrell? I think it's good for people to hear it. Okay. So with our application for the online program for the secondary level, we have a couple key players, if you will. One is called a learning coach and one's called a content tutor. So the learning coach in my mind kind of acts as the advisor. So they're gonna check in with all the students, make sure they stay on track. If they're struggling, they'll be the first to flag that and say, oh, I got a student that's struggling here or falling behind the pace. Uh, talk with the student, talk with the family, possibly talk with the content tutors or other staff to say, hey, what's going on here? What can we put in place? What interventions do we have? And so that learning coach is um, kind of the overall overseer just to make sure everyone's on pace, going at, a, at, a, at the pace that they should be going. The content tutor is each content area has a content tutor. So the, what they're gonna be doing is they'll be correcting the online work. If a student's struggling, they're the content expert. So then they would um, connect with that content tutor and student and help through whatever it may be, whether that's a Zoom call or a phone call, um, just going through that uh, part that's, uh, that they're struggling with. And so they're tutoring them. And then they're also gonna adjust the class as needed. So if there's IEPs or EL students or just general things that come up where that content tutor can say, hey, you know, I'm gonna take this out, but I'm gonna put this in in place and, and navigate that as they go. So that's the content tutor where they're correcting and tutoring uh, the actual student through the course. We also have special ed uh, teachers, so that will be um, dealing with our special ed um, population. And we have a promise fellow that's gonna help as well with uh, any kind of tutoring or any kind of extra help that's needed. And so trying to put those supports in place so that the students and families feel supported and know, okay, yep, there's plenty of people that I can talk to uh, if I am starting to struggle. So. That's the general gist. The learning coach and or counselor will work with students to make them aware of their pacing. So that's one of those main goals is to just make sure, hey, stay on pace. This is what's happening. This is what you need to get done by this time. The elementary teachers, we use the STAR assessment to determine the baseline and work with families to ensure growth. So that's the secondary and the elementary are the two kind of levels that we're seeing in those two. Uh, and then stewardship, Program staff will collaborate with myself to just make sure we're using our resources efficiently and effectively to maintain that fiscal responsibility. Next slide. Thank you. And as you notice, these are generic pictures because I don't have any of the actual students quite yet. But next year, you're going to see some actual students up there. So right now it's clip art. So I thought, sorry about that. Thank you, Daryl. We know this is a new responsibility for you, but you obviously have great vision and already a really good understanding of, of the challenges and, and how you want to ensure kids are successful in our Portage um, program. So uh, board members, questions, comments? Amy. Uh, two questions. Again, thank you for your report. You. Um, the first question is, how did you come up with 80% of the students will maintain the proper pacing? Because I don't know, it seems low to me, but um, I'm just wondering how that happened. And my other question is, um, if students want to take more than the minimum number of credits, is that encouraged? How does that work? Um, and can they just 
just tell me how that works. Yep. So, so the for the first one, it was an educated guess. So we looked at the pacing that people were maintaining last year, slightly below 80% of the students were maintaining that pace. And so we wanted to bump that up a little bit um, and, and you know, take an educated guess. We didn't want it to have it too low because we want to make sure, you know, a lot of students are maintaining that pace because it's crucial uh, if they do decide to go back into the building or transfer back to their home district or whatever it may be. And so we uh, right now took that educated guess, but it will be definitely something re to reflect upon because next year, once we have that baseline, we'll know if that was too low or if that was a pie in the sky goal because right now we're not sure. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what type of students choose Portage and how self-motivated they are. Yep. So. Yep, for sure. And th then my other question was additional credits for those self-motivated students? Yeah, so uh, there are, uh, you can, there's a minimum amount to just make sure you maintain a full-time student status, but you can work ahead. And so last year we did have some students that worked ahead um, and you can work ahead to um, kind of accelerate, if you will. Uh, we haven't gotten too far into the weeds as far as if we want to have a um, criteria to say, oh, this is far enough, or if we're just really unleashing them totally. So those are further conversations that we're going to talk about just to make sure we have um, what's good for the student um, in mind as, as we make those kinds of official policies. But to start the year right now, they can work ahead. And especially if they're accelerated, like if they're in a fifth grade level and they want to or if they're in fifth grade, but reading at a sixth grade level, uh, we have things already in place that they can do that. So they can um, kind of bump up levels if they if they need to or want to. For the elementary school, how closely does the curriculum sort of track the in-person curriculum to so it'll be smooth transition if, if and when they do go back to going in person? Yep, so that is the ultimate goal is to try and mirror that. Um, with that being said, the online uh, program is more flexible. And so there are some more moving parts to that, uh, but to try and make that as fluid as possible if they are going from one program to the other is the ultimate goal. Uh, we are using the same curriculum, same programs, all that stuff that they're using in the building. So that definitely helps with um, making that bridge as seamless as possible if they are moving from one to the next. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Corey. Thanks for being here, Daryl. I'm curious, can you tell us what the porridge enrollment is today? And then with just a couple of weeks till school starts, how much maneuvering can you do uh, to move teachers around to either an increased enrollment or decreased enrollment in the next two weeks? Yep. So right now, just I haven't checked it during the meeting, but right before the meeting, we're at 86. And so we're um, lower than we were last year with 600 some, I think it was last year. Um, but 86 is a pretty... Uh, I'm I'm very pleased with that number because I like to you know start small, make sure we build a quality program, and then we can scale that up relatively easily once we have that solid building foundation um, in place. And so that's where we're at right now. We have uh, the staffing um, in place for that solid uh, start of the year, and we actually um, have some room to grow yet with the staffing that we have. So we. We're not overstaffed, but we have some room to grow with um, having some more students that may uh, join here at the last minute, uh, which is fine. And so we do have a little bit of leeway, but if we have a huge influx of students, then we'd reevaluate and um, again, try and scale up as much as we can, as quickly as we can to accommodate. We don't wanna leave any of the buildings high and dry. We don't wanna leave families or students high and dry to try and make that as quickly as we can. Other questions or comments? I just had one question. One, one aspect we talked about with Portage is the ability to almost be somewhat of a hybrid where they could come to um, particularly the secondary level for band or maybe a um, industrial technology course. Are you seeing um, any students wanting to take advantage of that opportunity? Yeah, so I had a student that was interested in an automotive class. Um, obviously, it's tough to do online to get the hands-on class like that. Um, and so we do have a little bit of that. We have a couple that were, uh, uh, they had some inquiries about 
expand Inquire, but they haven't signed up officially for those yet. And so we do have some, uh, it's not a overwhelming amount, but there are a handful that are interested in the property. Excellent, that's, that's great. So yeah, when you talk about the numbers, what we have looked at this always is just the, the long game. You know, we understood that um, the success of the program last year was was really drove the the process to go to the Minnesota Department of Education and be approved as an online provider and looking at long term how this will really serve to to um, set you know be a good solution and a good option for a lot of students so thank you for taking on this new responsibility and we'll look forward to hearing we wish you all the best with the year so thank you thank you thanks. Okay. Um, really thank you. Um, we'll move on to our last item for discussion and report. Dr. Hillman is here to provide an update about district operations and COVID-19 preparations. Yes. So we have uh, three parts of the report this evening. I'll go through some of the local data uh, about uh, COVID-19 in Rice County over the last few weeks. I'll share a little bit of a vaccination update. I will explain uh, some some things we've learned about the voluntary uh, testing program that the state is offering schools this year. And then I'll share some other items, up, updates for you around educators leading the profession. It's an exciting uh, pilot program that we're in partnership with Education Minnesota this year. And then we'll talk a little bit about our new buildings and grounds, Director Cole Nelson. So just as we do at each board meeting for the last 15 or so year or 50 or so months, it feels like 15 or so years, but it's 15 or so months, we share with you the updates uh, around what we've seen the week over week collection. Uh, we had already published the packet before the latest uh, piece of data came out, but for the week of uh, August 8th through the 14th, there were 109 new incidents uh, in COVID-19 in Rice County during that week. And I think we just, again, have seen this ramp up fairly quickly. If we go back to July 11th, there were a total of seven new cases during that week. We went to 25 the next week, 79 the following week, 80, and then 109. I'm hopeful that that slowdown uh, is showing that the peak is coming. Uh, we've seen that with previous surges uh, where we'll see a slow a slowing of the increases. Well, that's kind of sounds weird, but uh, so hopefully we are getting to the top of this particular increase uh, and would start to see those weekly incidents go back down. Uh, when we look at the Centers for Disease Control, they have a new way of looking at counties across the country and Rice County is in that high community transmission uh, rate as are the vast majority of the counties in Minnesota at this point. Uh, so those are the pieces of data. In addition in the packet, uh, as you approve the, uh, the safety measures for uh, the 2021-22 school year on August 9th, part of that was as we made adjustments or procedures that I would bring those forward to you to share uh, how we would roll some of those pieces out. And so again, we want to come back to the purpose that the purpose of the safety measures is to prioritize in uninterrupted and in-person learning for our students. We've heard several pieces tonight about how critical that was uh, for our students to be successful. We also know there are some students who did really well online and they have that option as well moving forward. Um, the two pieces of uh, procedures that I brought for you tonight that I'll ask you to approve later in the meeting. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is just the state high school league. Actually, I'll start with the face covering procedures. So again, these are not any necessary, this is not um, any difference in what we asked you to vote on the last time is really to define specifically, last year we had the governor's executive order that outlined what were the exceptions for face coverings uh, to that executive order. So looking back at that, uh, what we did is we put together some procedures for us to be able to use to implement the mask requirement, identifying circumstances where uh, face masks or face covering should not be worn. Uh, people who could potentially be exempt. And again, that's a very similar definition to last year. That includes people with specific medical conditions, mental health conditions, or disabilities. Uh, we identify when are times when a, a face covering can temporarily be removed. So we go through all of our different programming in terms of childcare, pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. Let's give some examples. So Obviously, in our child care, it's you know, when people are eating or drinking or communicating with an individual who's deaf or hard of hearing, communicating with an individual who has a disability, medical condition, or mental health condition that makes communication with that individual uh, difficult in that circumstance, uh, participating in activities where the face covering could get wet, receiving medical services, and for our youngest, for in our child care, for when children are engaged in rest time or sleeping. Those 
uh, removal, those temporary removal uh, permissions are very similar across all three of the areas that we highlight. Uh, and in pre-kindergarten through 12th grade, we also identify staff members working alone in their own classroom. They have the ability to temporarily remove their face covering. So you'll see that those pieces are in there. It also defines how a person can make the request uh, to have an exemption, what is needed for that. If we already, if, if we know that there's an exemption that exists from last year, it provides us the ability not to have to have the parent provide us that documentation again. So again, this is a set of procedures uh, that allows us to be able to implement the requirement that was passed at the last meeting. So that's the first part. Uh, it also goes through compliance and access to face coverings and things like that. So that's what are in those initial procedures. The second document is the addendum that we have for the state high school league governed activities. And as I outlined in the last time that we met, uh, we know that the state high school league had a set of guidelines that we had been waiting for. We received those guidelines. Part of what we're recommending to you this evening um, are some uh, specific procedures for uh, universal masking when it comes to the state high school league sanctioned activities. I'll be really clear, we're only talking about state high school league sanctioned activities. Uh, there is a shared expectation uh, across the league and wanting to make sure that uh, the level of play is similar amongst schools. So in terms of, as you know, uh, outdoor activities, there's no masking required outdoors. Any of our masking requirements do not apply when you are outdoors. In the indoor activities, uh, so for a student athlete, the students would wear a face mask indoors unless they're actively engaged in an athletic drill, scrimmage, performance, or competition. Now, students may choose uh, to wear a mask during competition if they so choose, um, but they are not required to when they are on the, the court or the, the field of play indoor. So if you think about how this would manifest itself in volleyball, you have six Northfield Raiders players on the court. Those students can be unmasked while well, everyone else on the sidelines would be masked, the coaches, the players on the sidelines, the officials, that kind of piece. Um, so that part is, is the component for the student athletes. Then we get to the spectators. And the issue that we have with spectators is because there's local control across the state, we know that there's going to be a lot of confusion about that with people traveling to other schools. So this is the one place where indoor activities were strongly recommending spectators to wear face masks, but it's not a specific requirement. We'll do all of the normal things that we do. We'll offer people uh, face uh, coverings to wear. But in this case, uh, as we look at it, these are outside the school day, completely voluntary activities. I'm volunteering to go to an event. I'm volunteering to go to another school to do that. So as we talked with uh, districts across the big nine, we think that this is the way that it can be the most consistent as we are interacting with other schools. And it's one of the reasons that we're looking at having the safety measures that we're having during the school day. Again, we know that people are going to interact in lots of different ways outside of school and trying to control the school environment to the best that we can is, is intended to be able to minimize transmission and make sure we can uh, prioritize uninterrupted person in-person learning. Now, the one piece that we could see in athletics that we just really wanna be straightforward about with students who do have the ability to be unmasked for a certain period of time, there is a greater possibility that quarantine uh, could be a requirement. And so we identify what those pieces are for quarantine. We also uh, identify the fact that we do strongly encourage unvaccinated uh, student athletes to participate in the state's COVID-19 testing program. Again, that's optional. It's not something that we're requiring and this uh, activities office will have those available. And then the minute, while the regional support teams that we worked with last year, uh, ours was out of Rochester, they have disbanded those teams. So we don't have the access to the regional epidemiologist in that group that we did last year, but we still do have access to the Minnesota Department of Health Sports Division. And they're very helpful uh, when you have an issue or an outbreak on an athletic team. We work with them to determine what are the risks and if we were to need to pause a season. Our hope is that all that we've learned over the last year that should really minimize the number of times uh, that anyone across the state needs to pause. But we also uh, can't be foolish because we know we've even seen professional teams that have had to pause in the last uh, several weeks because that's just the way this thing goes. And so uh, if we can't have professional teams make it through a season, we have to just make sure that we understand that that can happen to us as well. But trying to take all of the reasonable precautions that we can, we want our student athletes to have this wonderful time of their life, right? We also wanna make sure that we protect them, that we protect the people around them, and so these reasonable exceptions for state high school league sponsored activities are pieces. And again, they are uh, rooted in the guidance from the Minnesota State High School League. 
So those are the two uh, new procedural pieces that I am asking to approve later this evening. Uh, finally, I do want to, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 update, uh, two more pieces, excuse me. So we continue to review the analysis of the aggregate analysis of we have of uh, data around vaccination. And so the latest data, we've not made a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, we're hoping for an update to our, our numbers very soon, but we're still showing that just over half, around 54% of our 12 to 17 year olds have been vaccinated. We're really hopeful that the FDA's approval of, uh, of the Pfizer vaccine today uh, with to removing that emergency purpose will help folks who might have been vaccine hesitant to be able to move forward. So that's the formal approval from the FDA. We're hoping that that is the case. Uh, again, we continue to share with people the opportunities that they have for vaccination. We think that that's really important that they have access uh, to that. And of course, Rice County has uh, the Rice County Public Health is continually working on vaccination. And there's all sorts of places in town that you can go to now. It, it's not like it was at the beginning where you are struggling to find a place. You're not having to drive to Wilmer, right, to be able to get a, a vaccine. You can get it at most of the pharmacies in the community. So that's a vaccine update. Then I just want to be really clear. Uh, I think there's been some confusion because the Department of Education last week sent something out indicating they gave schools a whole bunch of options for COVID-19 testing. And as you know, we were the pilot site last uh, late November, December for the Department of Health in terms of school-based testing, optional testing. Uh, I want to be really clear that at this point, we are not looking, there's no required testing. I think some people saw that and they got concerned, is the school going to require testing? I want to be unequivocal, that is not what the uh, testing program is about. But what we know is that testing has become more difficult to access. So where it was used to be very ubiquitous, you could get it nearly anywhere. And, and you're just seeing that that has been, you're having to wait longer to get a test than you used to. So the state is providing free of charge to schools a variety of different testing options, and they are also doing some reimbursement for staffing if that is needed. That's a big challenge that we have. If we do have people who want to test, how do we make sure that we set it up, organize it, and pay people to be there to make sure that they are able to help them with that? Uh, we just, we, again, we just got this information last week. There are many more options this year than there were last year, and so we are looking at what are the right pieces for us, uh, and we are... Um, we just filled out a survey today and we're waiting for more information from the Department of Education, but we anticipate, you know, the program to be very similar to what it was last year, where there's a day of the week where uh, staff or students uh, would be able to participate with a test. One of the things that I think will be better this year is if we did have a student who had symptoms and one of our school health professionals, either one of our school nurses or our uh, uh, health aides are working with the family and they're having difficulty having access to testing, we are now able to give that family a test. They take the test home, they complete it through Zoom with Vault, and they have that ability to do that on their own. We started to do that at the end of last year a little bit, but that was really a barrier for a lot of families as testing had become more difficult. So I just wanna be clear with the board that we're not uh, planning at this point to do any kind of required testing. I just wanna be clear about that, but we are gonna provide people options should they need that because we know that options for testing in the community just they're not as, as uh, available as they once were. So that is the COVID report this evening. I uh, wanna talk a little bit about educators leading the profession. So this is uh, really exciting. We know many teachers leave uh, the profession after the first three years or within the first three years of uh, becoming a teacher. It's very hard work. Uh, we have had a mentoring program for some time. Uh, it is not nearly what we're going to get through educators leading the profession. And so the district was selected uh, for a pilot new teacher mentoring program. It's a partnership, it's a grant from uh, Education Minnesota, our local Education Minnesota uh, Association president, Kevin Dahl, uh, reached out and said, hey, would we wanna try this? We're one of three school districts in the state to be selected. And so we're using also partnering with, it's a national vendor called Educators Leading the Profession. And we're gonna be able to support 14, up to 14 new elementary general education teachers, they're going to receive the same kind of specific building operations mentoring that they have in the past. Um, but they're also going to have access to instructional coaching uh, via an experienced out of district uh, educator from the educators leading the profession program. It's going to be a, a virtual piece. And my understanding is that it's going to be virtual for that instructional coaching component. But again, you've got two parts. There's the piece about when I come to a new school to work, how do I make sure I understand what the culture of that school is? How do I understand where the, where the popcorn machine is? And how do I get all those kinds of things that we all need as human beings to be able to get acclimated to the workplace? 
What are the, how does our PL, how do our PLCs work? What happens when we have a snow day? How do I handle this when I need to bring a student to a student assistance team? Those are the kinds of things that our mentors have always done very well. And that next layer from educators leading the profession is again, giving them some specific additional non-evaluative feedback about their instruction. So again, we're one of three pilots through the state to see how does this work to have this multiple uh, person approach. And again, we're gonna support up to 14 different teachers. And I'm really happy to share that uh, we've got three just amazing experienced educators who are gonna be our local building mentors. So many of you know Gail Cole from Bridgewater. She'll serve as the mentor at Bridgewater. Uh, Sari Zak at Greenville Park has been a longtime mentor. She'll continue in that role at Greenville Park. And Paula Bargery from Spring Creek. So we've got our, our new teachers, which we have quite a few this year, are very lucky to have these local experienced mentors. And then they're gonna have this additional layer of support from educators leading the profession. Again, I really appreciate Kevin Dahl uh, for thinking that, boy, this is a program that we could work with and we could potentially be a partner with. So that's very exciting. We're really thrilled to be able to provide uh, those new teachers with that support. And we have teachers who have a variety of different levels of experience coming in. And they're all going to be those, again, those general education teachers are the ones who are going to get that support. Uh, finally, uh, we spoke with you in the last couple of months about the transition where we were very disappointed to see our uh, Buildings and Grounds Director Jim Culseth retire uh, at the end of July, but we were also very excited uh, to welcome Cole Nelson. Uh, we'll have Cole at an upcoming meeting here in the next couple of months, but Cole is our new Director of Buildings and Grounds. He joined us in late July. Uh, he comes to our Northfield School District leadership team. He served for five years as the Assistant Construction Manager for Rochester Public Schools. He has hit the ground running. We had one week of a crossover between Jim and uh, Cole, so that was helpful. Uh, and then he's just really hit the ground running. Finishing the, his background in the construction uh, department at Rochester Public Schools has really been helpful as we've been finishing some of the work that I shared with you last month, restroom updates, the high school, remodeling of the old district offices. So you can just see how he is right on top of those things. And we just want to welcome Cole to our team. So that is the operations update for this evening. Excellent. Thank you. Board members, questions, comments? I have uh, two questions. So um, thank you for, for putting through the procedure based on the resolution we have with the COVID um, protocols. Um, my question on the um, educators leading the profession is really sounds like an amazing program. Um, will the teachers have the opportunity to do some of that instructional coaching um, during their prep time? Or is that, is, does the, uh, department, uh, the state give us any um, funding to possibly bring in a sub or how will that work? Correct. So there's there's a little bit of uh, opportunity for us to utilize a substitute for some of those pieces, um, as well as uh, a person's prep time or the before school. Obviously, the instructional coaching, the observation is going to happen during instruction time, right? So that's going to happen then. And then there's a variety of ways that uh, the educators leading the profession, instructional coaches can connect with those general. So it's really about what's the best time for that teacher. It could be during their prep time. It could be, it's, it's their choice. It could be before school. It could be after school, whatever works for them. And the educators leading prof the profession are providing some, there's some additional stipend for our local mentors as well on top of what we normally provide, which is, is very modest, I think is fair to say. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I did wanna go back to the COVID protocols and I just yes. wanted to thank you for the work you did, particularly around face coverings and just you, you emphasized and talked about how for the most part, we understand you know, the students and we've worked with them and understand where we have to um, have those that, that have um, certain conditions that uh, 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 face coverings just not um, gonna be something they can do. So. I did want to talk about the, the resolution in terms of there was no timing or date of when we would um, necessarily sunset the requirement of face masks. Or So if you could just talk about some of the metrics that um, you will be watching, the board will be watching in terms of um, when we can make modifications to that resolution. Yeah, so I think there are three key metrics that we're looking at. So the first one, would, there's, there's two different pieces. There's the local infection rate and the local illness rate. And those two things sound similar, but they are different. So the local infection rate, we'd be looking at those cases in Rice County and here in Northfield. And so the, the key thing is wanting to look for those lower rates. And what, what do lower rates uh, look like? 
We are still learning that as we continue to see a, a definition about a lower rate last winter was is very different, right, than what a, a lower infection rate was uh, this summer. So we're looking at that, we're working with public health, we'll continue to work with our public health and medical partners to determine what are those low infection rates look like. The second part would be the vaccination rate and still wanting to see that vaccination rate go up within the county, uh, all for in terms of the, the students who are eligible for vaccination, uh, as well as for, you know, continuing to track and to try to understand how the adult population in the county is also doing it really focused on those eligible students. And I, I really just want to be transparent that I, you know, for the younger students who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated, this that that requirement will most likely be in place longer for those students until there's an opportunity for vaccination. And then the third part is that illness rate. And so we have long looked at the illness rate, but the illness rate is something that we are now tracking and keeping. So last year, in many years, we would look at it in our school nurses. We During the flu season, they'd be looking at what those influenza-like illness rates are. The state gets concerned when we hit 5%. So some people in the room may under, remember a couple of years ago, there was a story about a school in Shakopee who hit that 5% threshold. They shut down for a few days. So that 5% threshold is when uh, the state gets very concerned. We're looking at what are those pieces that we can use where the combination of those three things are low enough to where we have confidence that we can remove the requirement. And again, I wanna point out that the safety measures that we have at the beginning of this year are far less than what they were last year. So, you know, last year we were preparing for three different kinds of schedules. We were looking at all sorts of different, uh, we were doing all sorts of signage. We were looking at very different ways to do lunch. Um, we had outdoor canopies and things like that. So. We've learned a lot in the last year, and as, as uh, I've shared before, you know, we understand what uh, the data is saying and what are the reasonable requirements that we can to keep this thing out and not let it take a foothold here in our part of the country. We have a responsibility to do that to the best of our ability. And so those are the three things that we'll be looking at it. And you all know that I love data and that I love to tell you, here's the, the mark and here's where we're going to be. Uh, we'll continue to look at what can, can we give a specific end point. Having been in, in this pressure cooker for 18 months and looking at more data than what I will ever care to remember when this thing is over, what I'll tell you is I've been burned by that before, right? I've been burned before by saying, uh, hey, this is the end goal, right? Because we know that as we've heard from experts that this thing does change the goalposts on us. And so uh, it's very difficult. I'd prefer to say, hey, here's what the, here's what the end game is. This is exactly where we want to be. I've shared a few of those pieces with you, right? Continuing to see the increase of vaccination rate. Um, and, and again, it's, it's fair to ask for what, you know, what is that rate? That's a fair question. And we, we will uh, continue to work on what is that right number. The pieces around illness and infection, because they are different, right? Infection and illness are different. Looking at those three pieces together are the, the key things that we will be using to try to uh, look at what can we do and how quickly are we able to remove it. But I do want to be transparent that for those students, who are yet to be vaccinated or yet to be eligible to be vaccinated, it is likely to last longer for those students. Amy. So since we're asking a few questions about the protocols, um, one question I have is when we talk about local, are we talking Northfield School District or Rice County? Yeah, so we look at a combination of both, right? And, and here's the reason. Uh, we have several hundred, over 275 students who are in open enrolled. Uh, that's, that was last year's number. I'm thinking that I'm in that ballpark, Val. Uh, so we have 275 students open enrolled from Faribault in our Northfield Public School. So we, we do need to understand what the Faribault numbers are. That's something that's important to take a look at. But we, are, we do get a weekly report. In fact, Rice County is sick of asking me, asking them to pull this, is that we look at that report each week by what were the new cases in Northfield? What were the new cases in Dundas? Now, those are the two biggest that we look at. We understand that there are some people who, you know, some, we'll, we'll look at Webster because most of the Webster, you know, folks come to Northfield. That's usually a fairly low number each week. But we know there's some from Lons. There's a few others that um, students who would be here. We also know that there's some students who could be part or some people who could be part of that, those weekly numbers that can attend other schools too. So what we do is we try to take a look at those major zip codes within the district as a way to judge the infection rate, right? And the vaccination rate. And then we're continuing to look at how can we drill down and get more detailed aggregate data about vaccination rates. And then the illness rate is very local and immediate, right? Because that is generated at each school. 
So that's a part that's something that comes from each school, Amy. Okay. And then my second question was about um, competitive activities as opposed to sports. Um, so debate, speech team, knowledge bowl, whatever. Um, are those still covered under the Minnesota State High School League um, <laughs> protocols? So at this point, it is only the state high school league activity. So in your question, speech is covered by that, right? Because speech is a Minnesota State High School League activity. Bowling is a Minnesota State High School League activity. Um, almost all of the pieces that we have this fall are, um, and when we really talk about athletics, we're specifically talking about those state high school league uh, pieces at this point. So do we have any activities this fall that we have to be concerned about for now? Um, at yeah, so one of the pieces we'll be looking at will be the fall play, for example. We're going to wait till that gets started and see how that, you know, how that particular piece goes. So that would be the, the big, that would be the big activity this fall that is not governed by the state high school league, but where, and it's a musical this fall. So that's where the risk can also play in, play a factor as well. So we'll be working with the fall play folks as they come back to look at what the protocols are for that event as well. And there are no competitive activities. That is not a competitive activity. No, yeah. to my knowledge, well, you'd have chess, right? Mm -hmm. You know, chess, which again, that would not be covered. It would be, would not be covered by that. So they would be uh, universal indoor masking when they are at our school. And having had some kids who played chess, I think that's probably okay. Um, and then just, that would be the only other competitive activity that I can think of in the fall. More of that is in the winter when you start to see things like Science Olympiad and Knowledge Bowl and those things. And again, we wanna resist looking too far ahead um, because I think the key thing here is that uh, we are really looking at how can we look at these pieces in chunks so that we can learn uh, from what we've done to this point as well. Thank you. No. Dr. Hillman, last year when uh colleges returned, we saw a jump in Rice County incident rate. Can we expect that again? And what's the influence? Yeah, that's a great question, Owen. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think one of the differences that we have last year to this year is that we know both colleges here in Northfield are private colleges. They have the ability to make decisions on their own. We know that both colleges, to my understanding, have adopted both a universal vaccination requirement. They're able to do that uh, very easily as a private entity, I shouldn't say easily, but they have the control to do that as a private entity. So my understanding is that they have required vaccination for both students and for staff. And my understanding is that they have also required universal indoor masking for students and staff. So those two pieces together, is that gonna say it's gonna stop uh, an increase? I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is that the colleges are taking this very seriously as they have, you know, from the beginning. Uh, and they were able to, you know, I think if you look at what the colleges did, I think they did an exceptional job. Uh, they were able to keep their students on campus all last year with very minimal interruption. And so I think the colleges, they were really focused last year on the surveillance testing. That was something that we know that they did very well with that. And that helped them keep the, the rates fairly reasonable. Um, however, we, we, and I can't tell you that, Noel, one way or the other, because um, I just don't have that answer. If I did, we would probably have this solved. Thank you for your insight. Tom. Is robotics club part of, uh, or how, how are they covered? Because that's after school and a voluntary thing. Right. So this, in fact, the I would uh, the robotics is exactly the same way governed by the state high, high school league as it is bowling. So they are technically uh, state high school league activities, right? And so that would uh, that would also follow that uh, the same protocols. And they start a little bit later. They don't usually when it, when it used to be a class. Remember, it was a class for a long time that started right away. It is no longer a class. So. My understanding is that they don't tech typically start that program until a little bit later. Now, usually the build season really starts in January. They, they will begin before that, right? Because they do a lot of work before that. But my understanding is it doesn't start right away. Now, I could be wrong with that, but again, they are a state high school league governed activity and they would fall under that same protocol. Other questions or comments? I just have one um, point of clarification regarding the districts, um, what we will do for contact tracing. Yes, great question. So we anticipate, um, and I will modify the language in our, our protocols uh, because our during the summer, we did not do contact tracing, right? The numbers were so low. I mean, they were under, under 10 every week. 
and the guidance that we had from the Department of Health was that we could we did, didn't necessarily have to do contact tracing or we didn't have very many cases this summer pre Delta. And so I think the key thing is that part of our approach is to make sure that we use the CDC guidelines so that we can drastically limit you know the number of people who are quarantined. And so while there won't be the kind of contact tracing that we did last year where our principals were in on the weekends checking out the seating charts and were these students or these because they were trying so hard to exclude as few people as possible, we're not going to need to go to that level again, but there are going to be certain circumstances through a series of interviews with students who test positive. Were they with other students where they were one or both of them were unmasked for that total of more than 15 minutes. Now again. It's very different than the kind of contact tracing that we did last year. Last year, we did this ubiquitous contact tracing. This is going to be a more individualized question-based piece to determine, are, is there anyone who would meet that criteria? There should be very few, if any, people who meet that criteria, but we do owe it to folks to make sure that we walk through that piece just to make sure that people are aware. We'll still be doing notifications. We're working on what does that notification look like. Um, but the, the point is, is that it will be a much different contact tracing than it was last year, but it, we, we still have to do some, what I would call limited contact tracing. Um, it's really probably no different than when a person tested positive and they called and talked with someone at the Department of Health. They did an interview where they talked about who are the people that you would have been within six feet for 50. This will be more about, were there people who you were with unmasked for uh, more than 15 minutes? So if you really think about it, that should be very minimal across the district. Excellent. Thank you for the report. My um, pleasure. So we'll, we'll move on now to the approval of the consent grouping. As a reminder, there were a number of personnel items in the table file that were added to the consent grouping. Um, is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Moved by Amy. Is there a second? Second by Corey. Um, I just wanted to make uh, two comments um, regarding uh, two of the items that are in the consent grouping. The first item I wanted to recognize, um, we have Dr. Hillman's new third three-year contract that will, um, which is what we're um, allowed a maximum contract length with our superintendent. So that contract will run through the 24-25 school year. Um, Dr. Hillman has just done an outstanding job since he took the helm six years ago, and he has been with the district for 12 years, and the board has great confidence in your ability and your strength of leadership to move the district forward. So mm -hmm. that contract is part of the consent grouping. And then the other item uh, to note is the Northfield Education Association, which is our teachers union. Um, our two-year contract is, is part of the consent grouping as well. And having been uh, part of the negotiation process with Amy Gorwitz and Noel Stratmon and Jeff Quinnell serving as a sub, the process once again was just conducted within a framework of mutual respect. And we share the common goal of doing what, working hard on behalf of our students and our community. So um, that negotiation process was, was um, excellent. And we are grateful to Val Mertesdorf and Molly Wieselman who were uh, the district uh, negotiators and, and just did a phenomenal job. So just wanted to make note of those two um, items within the consent grouping. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move now on to items for individual action. We do have uh, four items this evening. Um, as Dr. Hillman just explained, we are um, going to approve the procedures um, supporting the 2021-22 COVID safety protocols. Um, that process procedures was based on the resolution that we passed at our August 9th board meeting. So is there a motion to approve the procedures supporting 2021-2022 COVID-19 safety protocols as presented? Moved by Tom, is there a second? Second by Amy, questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, our next item um, is the Portage um, Handbook that we did first reading on at our August 9th board meeting. So is there a motion to approve the proposed 21-22 
elementary and secondary portage handbooks as presented. Moved by Amy, is there a second? Second by Noel. Is there any questions or comments on those handbooks? No? Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, our next item is the board is asked, uh, is we're approving uh, Dr. Hillman's uh, superintendent goals for the 21-22 school year. And, and uh, we discussed those um, and we're able to um, hear directly from Dr. Hillman on his goals at our August 9th board meeting. So we're formally approving them with this motion. Um, is there a, pro a motion to approve those goals? Moved by Tom, is there a second? Second by Corey. Any questions or comments? We just appreciate the great work that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, we, well, we'll, we'd like to hear it from you. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Hillman does a great job. So, I mean, you'll say it better. No, I won't. Not, the, the message is still the same. We just appreciate the hard work we know you will continue to do and, and the goals are just um, really spot on and we know we'll, we'll keep us moving forward. So excellent, thank you. Um, so we have a motion and a second, correct, Anita? Okay, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Um, opposed? Motion carries. Um, our last item is bid for the district uh, MacBooks, which again, we, we discussed at our August night, or yeah, August um, ninth board meeting. So is there a motion to approve the tech to school bid for the district's previously leased MacBook Pro and MacBook Air laptops? Moved by Corey, is there a second? Second by Amy. And Julie, I've got Kim here just to briefly describe. Oh, excellent. I'm sorry. I didn't even see you, Kim. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, Thank we you. We had an excellent bid day. Let's just Kim put it that Brisky way. is our uh, director of industrial instructional, instructional uh, technology. technology services. Yes. Technology services. All sorts of things. I'm sure the, the formal uh, title. So thank you. So happy you're here to explain this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I didn't come with a presentation for you, but if you do have questions about the bids, we received 16 bids for the purchase of the MacBooks that we leased for our teaching staff initially, our initial MacBook lease that we've now replaced with a new lease. Um, the highest bidder was Tech to School with a minimum payout of $140,000 for those devices. At the high end, if they're all graded in top condition, they would give us 192.5 for those devices. So definitely above what we were um, anticipating on a conservative side, but um, we're quite happy with the bids. That's really excellent. Thank you. And, and in the Valmersdorf School of Be Conservative, we always have found that that's a win. So thank you for that. And, and, and well. the bid uh -huh. is really sound and um, it will be, will be interesting to see where it comes through, but $140,000 again is over what, what the projection was. So that's really excellent news. Questions? Amy. Hi, Kim. Um, do you have any idea what they're going to use them for? Um, they will be resold and it's an education company purchasing them. So they'll be resold probably in smaller numbers. We sell them as one entire lot for the same buyer. Um, and they will, they will do as they, we have actually purchased from this, this vendor in the past um, to supplement student iPads. If we have been nearing the end of our lease and not able to purchase the same model new. Um, so I would imagine there's some of that that happens with other districts as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent. So I believe we have a motion and a second, right? Kind of got sidetracked, so I apologize for that. Thank you, Anita. So we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the bid for the previously leased MacBook Pro and MacBook Air laptops. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks for your work on that, Kim. Thank you. Uh, we can move on to, uh, that concludes um, our items for individual actions. So items for information, Dr. Hillman is going to provide an update on our district's e-learning plan. Yes, yeah, so uh, if you recall, um, back when we had snow days, right, we worked to try to pilot uh, using an e-learning plan as allowed by the state uh, to avoid having too many days actually canceled because of weather. So we've used this for uh, several years. Uh, what we're statute indicates is that we're required to notify families uh, that we plan to do an e-learning plan again this year. Uh, that has been included in uh, the uh, student handbooks that are going out. We are also, um, as teachers are starting to come back, we're putting together a small work team to be able to take a look at the previous e-learning plan and do any updates that uh, we now have had the opportunity to learn from the distance learning experiences that we've done. 
So in the past, uh, a lot of it was very asynchronous. I think that you'll see there's some possibility of a little bit more of synchronous and asynchronous kinds of pieces during the day. It also has to do with the number of days that you know we have before we move into um, uh, an e-learning piece. So we're still working through that. So again, the notification that's required for families, that's been done, uh, but we are able to take a little bit of the beginning of the year just to polish that plan. And then we would plan to share that with people uh, well before the snow season starts flying. So again, we plan to use, we plan to use the strategy uh, and then we're just doing some polishing of some of the details of how that would look. Claudia, question. Will Portage students also participate? Uh, uh, can you explain how that would work? Snow days and days. Yeah, off? so Portage. Portage is Portage will follow our calendar, um, but there won't be cancellation of school, obviously, in Portage. So they'll continue forward as normal. That's part of what we heard from families last year is that um, even in the emergency response, they really did appreciate the fact that we were able to continue on. And so that that consistency of schedule uh, is important. With last year, we were actually considering if we closed to give Portage students a snow day because we thought that was important. But as we keep moving forward, as people have committed to uh, the online environment like this in a different way, um, having that ability for people just to continue on regardless is the plan. Other questions or comments on the e-learning plan? So are we doing one or two snow days before we kick in? Yeah, so right now, what we still have is two days. Um, we'll be working through that if there's the possibility of reducing that to one. But right now, what we would still have on the calendar is the two days. And then it kicks in on the third day. Okay, excellent. Thank you. When I think, as Sam Richardson, you know, discussed, it's just all of the technology that everyone is so familiar with and just how, uh, what quality, um, of instruction we'll be able to provide on those e-learning days. So, And I do also want to point out, you know, I think one of the other pieces that is coming out of the pandemic is that uh, we had these partnerships with uh, the local companies in terms of helping us get internet access for students. So we still did have some students who didn't have access to the internet. We had protocols of how long they could have to submit their assignments in the old e-learning day plan. But a couple of pieces continue to work through the partnership with HCI, even our students who uh, did not who had internet access, it may not have been uh, as robust as needed for that. So we're, we're still going to be able to through this and then something called the federal emergency connectivity. Um, it's the emergency emergency connectivity fund. Uh, we're going to be able to continue to provide some students who qualify uh, with those hotspots for school district work. So I think that that's one of the things that you're seeing coming out of the pandemic is that uh, schools will provide a little bit more of those kinds of services to students as needed. So we know that we got some funding for that from the Emergency Connection Fund, and then we also have partnered with HCI uh, to be able to continue that program that we had la in the last couple of years. Excellent, thank you. So um, that is it for items for information. Uh, future meetings, Monday, September 13th, and Monday, September 27th, both of those are at 7 p.m. and are will be held here in the Northfield District Office Boardroom. So with thank you everyone for a great meeting. Um, with that, I ask for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second by Tom. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned.